scriptures talk about a blessedness that happens to a man whose delight is in the law of God. So as someone says, it says, but his delight is in the law of God. And doth he meditate day and night. He says that that man is like a tree planted by the rivers of water, whose leaves do not wither, when he bears fruit in every season. As you are about listening to this message, we believe that your life is going to be like that man planted by the rivers of water. Your leaves are forever going to bear. And we know that your, your season will not pass by. You will forever shine and you will forever bear fruit. We have a lot of content to share with you. So we would entreat you to subscribe to this channel as well as like us. Hit that notification bell to receive more updates from us because we know that whatever content here is going to set you on calls at every time. It's going to make you attain whatever stature that Christ wants you to attain. Thank you. Praise the name of the Lord. Uh, I am really delighted, very, very happy to be coming to us by way of the cloud. I bless God for this privilege that he's given. Um, I'm very, very happy and I want to appreciate everyone who is following on the social media platforms from your homes, your phones, your computers. Thank you so much in the name of Jesus. Uh, I'd like to begin by really expressing my gratitude. Thank you so, so much for your love for me. I am overwhelmed. I have already received thousands, thousands, literally, of text messages from all over the world. Thank you. It's an honor to serve His Majesty. Um, I'm also happy and blessed to um, be able to bless our hearts on this day. It's a special day for me. And um, I believe that the truths that we'll be hearing would be most edifying. I really, really appreciate every one of us. I'd like us to pray and then we'll just get to the word. Father, thank you. Thank you for our global family all over the world, from America to the United Kingdom to South Africa, Nigeria, Kenya, China, Germany. Thank you, oh God, for the many who are connecting, the many who will hear these truths. In the name of Jesus, I pray that you will bless your people. Let today mark a turnaround in our lives in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. I want to thank you for your love for me. I am overwhelmed. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not somebody who really, really loves to, uh, you know, just be around the spotlight. I'm quite a conservative person, so you can imagine what this means for me but I truly, truly want to express my gratitude. I'm told that there have been so many things happening on the internet just to show honor, and I truly appreciate. It's an honor to serve this generation. It's an honor to be a blessing to all of you, my precious family in Zaria, and then our global family. Thank you, I love you, and I appreciate you uh, with all my heart. Now, I began to think very carefully on the things that I'll be sharing and um, it's been my conviction, it's been my persuasion to ensure that people um, get blessed and have an accurate understanding of the ways of the Spirit. And I thought that sharing something along that line would be a blessing to us. Um, so I really want us to pay attention. I want you to lend your destiny this few minutes to receive the word of God that will come to bless, that will come to lift in the name of Jesus Christ. Today, by the privilege of his grace, um, you are celebrating me and celebrating what God has done and continues to do in and through my life. But there are principles that have been followed through the years and have been kept that are responsible for the results that we now celebrate. Ultimately, it is the grace of God, but then it's an intertwining of systems and principles. And I really would want to share some of them. This would be my birthday gift 
to our global family and all who are connected to this grace. Uh, I'd like to share what I title the principles of transgenerational impact. I'm concerned about the sustainability of our impact, not just the impact. Bless God for the privilege and the opportunity. Um, but then I really, really would want to uh, pour this out as a birthday teaching to just bless our hearts. And I pray the Lord will bless us in Jesus' name. Acts chapter 13 and verse 36. The Bible says that, And David served his own generation. He served the purposes of God, some versions will say, in his own generation. Not only did he serve his generation, the Bible says he served the purposes of God, but also in his generation. And it is, it is important to not only serve God, but to serve God in a way and a manner that is relevant to the context of a generation. And there are principles that I have kept in my life, and uh, there are principles that have come from the Word of God. This is my Bible right here. I believe the Word of God with all my heart. This is all that has made me what I am. I have profound reverence and respect for the Word of God. And um, I, I, I want to share with you these principles, and they would bless your heart. <clears throat> First, it's important for us to know that God is a God of patterns. Exodus chapter 25 and verse 40, when Moses began to build the tabernacle in the wilderness, again he was told that he builds according to pattern. In this kingdom, we're not given the luxury and the privilege of inventing our pathway to success or inventing our pathway to the knowledge of God. This path has been predefined. Our assignment, like Prophet Jeremiah would say, is to ask for the ancient path. And then when we find it, that we walk therein and find rest for our soul. So God is a God of pattern. When you read in Exodus chapter 40, Exodus chapter 40 uh, from verse 16 and then from verse 33 down to 35, the Bible clearly states that God continued to come to tell Moses, ensure that the tabernacle is built according to pattern. And then the Bible says something interesting. The B part, the Bible says from verse 33, and so Moses finished the work according to pattern. Then the Bible now says, and the glory of God came. The glory of God came and covered the entire tabernacle such that the priests could not even enter. I have said it again and again that the glory of God will always come as a confirmation that his patterns have been honored. Every time divine patterns are honored, the glory of God is the effect. His glory comes to honor the fact that his patterns have been kept. So if the glory of God comes upon a ministry, the glory of God comes upon an individual, the glory of God comes upon um, a family, the glory of God comes upon our finances, our lives, a nation. It is only proof that the patterns of the kingdom have been kept. It is very important for us to understand this. Many people desire the glory of God. We desire the glory of God in our lives, in our businesses, in ministries, our career, and so on and so forth. But the challenge is not the unwillingness of God, as it were, to reveal his glory in our lives. The challenge most times is that we are not walking in keeping with his prescribed patterns. Amen. And so I'll take a few points that I've written down here to be a blessing to us. Number one, the first key that must be um, <clears throat> observed and kept for any life and any destiny that seeks to be able to make impact in this generation especially, and it's been consistent with every generation, is that you must know God. This is very important. The knowledge of the Holy One is critical and very important. 
I'm sure that several people will be watching from different nations of the world, belonging to different faiths and, and beliefs and all of that. And, and I have profound respect for whatever it is that you believe. But as a child of God, one whose convictions are referenced from Scripture, I can tell you that the Bible can turn any man into a wonder because it helps you to know the God of heaven. Very, very important. John chapter 17. John chapter 17 and verse 3. Jesus is praying now. And then he says, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the Father and then the Son. The knowledge of the Father and the Son is eternal life. The one true God. It is very, very important. Most people fail in life primarily because we do not have convictions. It is terrible to live in this generation without convictions. To dilly dal between thoughts, dilly dal between opinions, dilly dal between perspectives, and so on and so forth. It is very important that we know God. Daniel 11 and 32, the B part says, But the people that do know their God, the Bible says, number one, they shall be strong. And then number two, they shall do exploits. Our exploits in life and our strength, our capacity is predicated upon our knowledge of God. And, and the knowledge of God does not just mean the mere awareness that there is a deity. No, no, not at all. It means a personal knowledge of God that leads to strength and conviction. Very, very important. Jeremiah Jeremiah chapter 9, the prophet was teaching, and when you read from verse 23 and 24, Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24, he says, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, he says. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. But then he says, Let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me. The pride of the believer is not in the acquisition of physical things and material things as important as they can be. Our pride and our confidence in this kingdom is predicated upon the experiential knowledge of Jesus Christ. This is very important. You will never be able to influence a generation when you do not know God. The advantage of the knowledge of God is that it brings what we call spiritual growth. You know, we talk a lot about spiritual growth, and most people think spiritual growth means participation in a denomination's activity. That may help spiritual growth, but ultimately, spiritual growth is measured by two indices. Number one, um, your degree of conformity. To the character and the image of the Christ. This is the first biblical index for measuring spiritual growth. And then number two, your depth of comprehending the mysteries of the kingdom. A man is said to be growing spiritually to the degree to which you, number one, conform experientially to the character of the Christ. And then number two, your depth of comprehension Ephesians 4 and verse 18 says, having their understanding darkened, it says being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them. It is important that we contend through the knowledge of God to strive, taking advantage of the grace supplied us to grow spiritually. Amen. And then also, um, I would want to say this. When you really, really want to know God, you must contend for the grace that helps you to embrace the whole counsel of God. Now, listen very carefully. Listen very carefully. What I'm saying is very, very important. Um, I think the reason why many people do not maximize their spiritual experience is because, um, and, and, and we preachers must take a very serious responsibility for this, I have taught again and again that a believer does not mature when we are, we are limited by just a dimension of God. God is multidimensional and the nature of his operation is that he reveals himself dimensionally to people. I have been given a dimension of the grace of God to communicate to my generation and I'm honored to be able to carry that 
that fire, that grace. But all that God has given me is not all that he has. And it's not all that is needed for a generation. Now, if I limit this generation to only my understanding of God and the perspective communicated to me, then other dimensions of God that are equally required to strengthen the body will not be there. This has been the challenge with ministries again and again. As well-meaning as we may be, we may not have mentored people properly into embracing the whole counsel of God. Sadly, the pandemic has come now and it has revealed several dimensions that we may not have paid attention to. For instance, the place for personal encounter and press for the things of God. There are people, respectfully speaking, who will have to depend on a pastor's teaching or a corporate fast, a corporate program from a church or a meeting to be able to grow spiritually because they have not been mentored into understanding that we must take personal responsibility for our spiritual growth. For, for such people, you can imagine how tragic it will be for them now that um, the, for, for most parts of the world and even this country, um, the, the, there's still a ban on having you know, religious activities localized and all of that. So many may not be able to grow until they are taught that they can have a personal relationship with God, that pastors and teachers, apostles and prophets are mere support systems, not the basis for knowing God. You see, this is very important. Another dimension, for instance, is the dimension of finances and the well-being of people. It's been an imbalance for many, many years in the body of Christ on both ways, neglecting it or exaggerating it. It's, it's caused a lot of problems. And you can see that there are families that have been stranded, people, companies have downsized people, and, and you know, their husbands and wives altogether who have lost jobs. And most people have not been taught accurately the economic system of the kingdom, the system allocated for the welfare of the saints. The side effect is that so many people now are languishing in want and poverty, and this in itself can become a distraction to our spiritual life. So I'm just saying that it is important that as we seek to inspire and bless our generation to be able to teach and also embrace the whole counsel of God. The whole counsel of God is not found with any single man as a ministry, but it can be outsourced as a product of meekness, a product of pursuit, and a product of diligent search. I have made up my mind as a man of God and one who has been a privileged steward of this mystery that I will, like a spiritual archaeologist, search for all of the dimensions that reveal the whole counsel of God and learn it for myself and my welfare and then do my best to communicate the same to the generation I've been sent to. And this is my first proposition that in our attempt to know God as the first key to influencing our generation, we must be open-hearted more than the doctrine of a denomination, more than the thoughts of a well-meaning mentor or father. This is not a proposition for rebellion at all. Please don't misunderstand me. This is only an attempt for us to enlarge our appetite for spiritual things so that we can incorporate within our spiritual space all the dimensions of God required for life and godliness. Amen. The second, very quickly, the second key that I've written here is that for you to be able to impact a generation, you must have a clear vision for your life. This is very important. It's unfortunate that we live in a generation that um, may not be as visionary as we should be. There is, is such distraction in our generation, especially among uh, the young people, there is, there is a clamor for our space, there is a clamor for our attention. The social media, as important as it is, it's been beneficial and we're taking advantage of it now to be a blessing, but there is a, there is a very demonic and subtle distraction that this generation is falling prey to. And it is important that we find a way of getting back in order. Vision is very important. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 7, it says, Lo, I come, as it is written of me in the volume of the book, to do thy will. 
Vision gives you focus. Vision gives you direction. Vision prunes your relationships. Vision prunes your activities. You get busy but not doing many things. Your energy is coordinated. Your energy is directed towards specific kingdom assignments. It is important to find a vision for your life. Your assignment is simply your contribution to kingdom come. Your contribution to the revelation of the Christ and the exaltation of the same. The role that you have been divinely given as far as the revelation of the glory of God is concerned. And I want to challenge everyone listening. It is important to sit back. Your ambition is not your assignment necessarily. It can be incorporated in your assignment. But it's important for us to find a vision for our lives. A lot of people live meaningless lives and we allow culture and status quo to define the next thing in our lives. Go to school, the next thing marriage, the next thing a job, the next thing children, the next thing, you know, a sense of significance and then people pass on to glory. It's not a very fulfilling life. It is important for us to be able to sit down and on this uh, day, uh, my birthday, I'm using the opportunity to challenge a generation to sit down. I had the privilege to be greatly mentored by Dr. Miles Munro and one of his books, the first of his books that I read many years ago was Discovering Your Purpose. That book radically transformed my life. It just set the coordinates of my focus. And today I live a very busy life, um, but then I am happy that my being busy is not shadow boxing. It is an intentional um, press towards accomplishing specific divine goals and visions. It is important. We must have clear visions for our lives. And those visions must be broken into goals. Not erratic goals that we just have today and then have tomorrow. There are many people who just fabricate goals here and there. There must be sustainability to our pursuit. You can't just choose to do this today, choose to do that tomorrow. Uh, you will not be able to influence a generation like this. One thing I can tell you about this generation is that they respect focus. This generation respects sustainability. Uh, you will never be able to accord honor from this generation when you vacillate in your convictions and your focus. Uh, with all humility today, you are celebrating my life and what God has done primarily because there has been consistency and focus. Anyone who knows me, whether it was 20 years ago, 10 years ago, I've been at the same thing, pursuing to see that the, the life of God, the reality of God is replicated across the earth. This is why I live. This is why I breathe. This is why I sleep. Everything I do is in honor of that vision. And so we must challenge ourselves to find meaning for our lives. When you find your vision, it will direct you, direct marriage, direct your job, direct your location where you settle, direct everything about your life. This is very, very important. We must also, still speaking about vision, um, let me say this. Many people, truly speaking, many people, I would say, are visionary. We've been able to find something to do with our lives. But I think the challenge for many people is that we just stop at the realm of visions and we never come up with strategies for actualizing that vision. It is not enough to have a vision. I want to have a great ministry. I want to build a great business. I want to be a good um, family man. I want to be a good career person, uh, you know, and so on and so forth. Most people have passed that realm of just documenting something that they think they want to state their lives for. But I am challenging everyone listening to me and everyone watching, master the science of achievement. It is very important. The strategy that turns dreams and visions to reality. It is important. It is wonderful to have a vision, but it is noble when the vision speaks. Today, by the grace of God, what we celebrate that we call koinonia, what we celebrate, the ministry that the Lord has committed to my hand, was once a vision. 
in the heart of a young man. But by the grace of God, through the networking of systems and spiritual strategies, today has become a blessing to everyone around the globe. And so I am challenging us. There are businesses, there are dreams that we have, there are ministries that are locked up from within our spirit. And many people continue to write these visions. They go for retreats. I want to build a house. I want to do this and that. But many of us have not mastered the science, the technology for achievement. And that is a whole subject I'm trusting by the grace of God that the Lord will grant grace as the weeks and the months progress. And when we have the opportunity to make contact with ourselves again so that the ministry of transformation continues, I, I trust that I'll be sharing specific strategies that we will be able to use to achieve dreams. You'll never move forward. You'll never truly be motivated when all you have is vision. As important as that is, you must be able to know how to turn dreams into reality. Praise the Lord. The next point that I have here is that to influence a generation, you must contend for mental transformation. Look, I cannot stress this enough. Listen to me. Please listen to me. Everyone listen very carefully. It is, it is important. The place of mental transformation, sustaining superior belief systems, belief systems that are beyond our cultural context, superior belief systems that are, are superior to our, our backgrounds, our failures of the past, and so on and so forth. Now, I've done a number of teachings. You can access them, uh, several teachings that, that relate to this. But let me say this very, very important. Proverbs, um, I mean, um, Ephesians chapter 3, I would say, verse 20, it says, Now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundant above all that we ask or think, ask or think, ask or think. That means God will do what we ask and he will also do what we think. Your thinking is also a prayer warrior. It raises requests to heaven. And we have many people that pray. Africa is a praying continent. Nigeria is a praying generation. Don't get me wrong. I am, I am a man of prayer. You know that. But I am telling you, you will never be able to rise to influence a generation globally, territorially, until you sustain a superior belief system. Most of the time we spend trying to live fake lives, going on social media to do a lot of things, you know, just try to act out narratives that are untrue. Those times can be invested into building belief systems that are superior. A superior belief system is a belief system that is referenced um, first from scripture and then referenced from a system of mentorship from men who have proven track records. A superior belief system is not an invention of an individual. These are pathways, mental pathways that have been proven to work. Every dimension of results that we seek has a corresponding belief system that attracts it. Success is not what you pursue. If you find yourself pursuing success of any kind, spiritual, financial, is, is, is already proof that you will never get it. Success is attracted by your growth. Success is attracted by the requisite belief system that controls it. Every dimension of grace, even the anointing, we're a generation that is so passionate about the anointing. The anointing does not just come because you are hungry. There is a requisite belief system. The oil did not come provided the vessel was small. As the vessel was expanded, the oil continued to expand to assume the size of the vessel. This is very important. A few script Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. The Bible says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Sustain this paradigm, this belief system that was in Christ Jesus. Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 7. The Bible says, for as he thinketh in his heart, interchange for mind as he thinketh in his heart, so he is or so is he. Very important, it equates your physical results to your belief system. You know, we talk a lot about mindsets. A mindset is not a belief system different from the one you have. 
You can have another belief system different from the one you have, but it produces the same result of failure. We're talking of a superior belief system outsourced first from scripture, from scripture, and that from a child, thou hast known the holy scripture, which is able to make you wise unto salvation. It is important. And then to sustain the ability to glean from the mind of extraordinary mentors, men and women whose lives through history, whose lives through their books have been able to command notable results. It is important. We must contend for mental transformation. Very, very important. Listen, this is how it is. Watch this. Your, your, I, I, I'm sure that the camera is, is, is capturing this. Your, your results, listen, your results are controlled by your actions. Your actions are controlled by your decisions. Your decisions are controlled by the information that has framed your belief system. Your belief system is controlled by the source of the information that has made that belief system. And the source of the information is controlled by the relationships and the associations you have kept. Let me repeat myself again. That your result, any result in ministry, in life, is controlled by the actions you have taken. And the actions that you take is controlled by your convictions or your belief systems. Your belief systems are controlled by the information, the source of information that has framed that belief system. And then ultimately, the relationships, the men and the women you have allowed into your intellectual space, the men and women you have allowed into your mental, your spiritual space. That means if there is a problem with your results, you need to trace it to the actions you are taking. You need to trace it to your belief system. You need to trace it to the source of the information. It matters who mentors you, not just that you are mentored. It matters what books you read, not just that you are a reader. It matters who you listen to, not just that you are a listener. Relationships are important. It's your relationship with God that brought you salvation. It's your relationship with the Holy Spirit that continues to provide spiritual guidance. So I think it is a cause for us to really, we want our results changed. But most times, we do not um, check the dynamics properly. We just want to keep focus people. They focus on action to change the result. So they try something, it doesn't work, they try another action. For as long as action is where you start from, you will live a frustrated life. You must start first from the associations and relationships. Then you now go to the information that comes from those associations. And then the convictions those informations bring. And then the actions that are taken in honor of those convictions. And then inevitably, you will have results that honor those convictions. So this is my third challenge um, to us as a, we must be able to sustain superior beliefs. I continue to challenge myself and I thank God for the privilege and the honor to serve this generation. And I thank you for trusting me with your loyalty and your honor. I do not take it lightly and I do not take it for granted. But then I continue to transit myself mentally to rise to the context that is able to bear this global demand and to communicate truth, to communicate righteousness in a way and a manner that can be a blessing to all and sundry, regardless of tribal affiliation, regardless of intellectual stratification, regardless of our political affiliations, regardless of what nation. It is important that we build ourselves intellectually, we build ourselves mentally, so that we can be able to communicate the life of God in a way that becomes attractive, in a way that becomes a blessing. My life has proven it again and again that chasing success is a total waste of time. We must trust God for grace. We must trust God for the ability to be able to um, attract success through the transitions that happen in our minds. Praise the Lord. Very quickly, the next point is that you must be extremely valuable. The key word is extremely. Listen, listen, listen. 
and I'm speaking to my generation. I know that there are people of all kinds of age ranges, but, but really, if you are from 45 years and under, please listen to me very carefully. This message is most important for you. There is a minimum standard of value that you must bring to the table of greatness for this generation to honor you, for this generation to recognize you, and for this generation to open up their hearts to receive of what you represent. And this is true for believers, sadly speaking and respectfully so. Many, many believers have not contended for the level of value that can make a reward system that is global in context. It is important for us to be extremely valuable. Hear what the Bible says in um, Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 16. Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 16. The Bible says the gift of a man, the gift of a man, my God. You know, as I'm saying this, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just overwhelmed by the truthfulness of this scripture. The gift of a man make it room for him and it brings him the gift is a vehicle the man does not go before great men he does not have what it takes to go it is the gift that transports him the value of a man like a lift lifting you from one building to the other you know when when you get into an elevator or a lift it will lift you from ground one to the last floor in a matter of minutes and the bible says that your value is akin to that elevator that it can bring you before great people we live in a generation that is obsessed about connection i want to know this i want to meet this person i know this person but the the surest way to be able to connect to relevant people is to be valuable the proof that you are valuable is that people pursue you all men seek for you. I've, I've said it humorously that there are things when you have, only the poor will look for you. There are things when you have, only the rich will look for you. There are things when you have, only children will look for you. There are things when you have, only adults will look for you. There are things when you have, only sick people will look for you. But there are certain dimensions of value when you have, like it was for Jesus, all men. All men will seek for you. They will veto your background. They will look beyond your weaknesses and limitations. They will, they will cross mountains and walk and pass through waters to meet with you. And this is my challenge to this generation. We must contend to be exceptionally valuable. 1 Kings 7 13 and 14. This is a scripture that has blessed me and I, I really would want you to take note of this scripture. 1 Kings 7 from verse 13 to 14. The Bible talks about a man called Hiram and the Bible says that King Solomon sent and fetched Hiram and the Bible says that he was, he was a widow's son. The background of this guy was not something that was desirable. He came from a background that was not, was not worthy of, um, it was not something to be proud of. But he rose to become one who served in the king's palace. He was a craftsman. Very powerful scripture. That means that your background is not the excuse. You can, you can walk your way through being exceptionally valuable to a point where you are blessed and listen you will only receive the reward of kings when you can serve kings if you serve mean men you cannot receive the reward of kings praise the lord in genesis chapter 41 genesis 41 when you read from verse 14 the bible says how that the king sent and they brought joseph from his dungeon they shaved him and he was ready to go before pharaoh and then he interpreted the dreams when you read from verse 33. He now advised the king. He said, um, king, search all over Egypt for a man who is discreet and wise. And he began to suggest an economic blueprint that will save the entire Egypt from financial, um, I mean, lack and want in the days that would come. And then when you read from verse 39, from verse 39 down to 46, the king himself said that there was no man paraphrasing. He had sought for a man and in a moment, ladies and gentlemen, the lifting power of being exceptional. 
in a moment within the twinkling of an eye a man's exceptional value made the king to honor him when you read from verse 39 to 46 several things happened to him you know he had the privilege of marrying um Potiphera, the daughter of the, you know, the, the priest of On, and, and so on and so forth, and, and, and he, he was lifted because of him. He preserved the nation of, of Israel in Egypt until there arose another Pharaoh who did not know Joseph. So we must be very, very valuable. If you're, if you're writing and you're noting, please take note of this. Every time I teach about value, and I think this is a timely message for this generation, value in my teaching and in my opinion, and this, and this is also consistent with scripture, is divided into two parts. Number one is your virtue. Our generation is, I think we've done fairly well in terms of the intellectual side of value. But the first dimension of value that I'm bringing for you is virtue. Virtue is a, virtue is a measure of your closeness to the character of Christ. It is not only important to be a good IT person, a good engineer, a good doctor, and so on and so forth. Um, we need men and women of solid character. It is true that we are men, but we must continue to contend to rise to a point where we are people of virtue. That when people look at you, you become the clearest expression of the Christ. This is very, very important. The Bible encourages us again and again to be able to build character, to be men and women, to put off the former man, you know, and his deeds, and to put on the new man recreated in Christ. And I appeal to this generation, I beseech you, like the apostle will say, by the mercies of God, that we pay attention to the value and the excellency of character. Character is an, is, a, is an aspect that our generation is losing. There are virtues, virtues of dignity, virtues of respect and honor, virtues of faithfulness, and all of these kinds of things. It is important that we trust God for grace to be able to embrace the kind of character that can make us desirable within the context of our generation. And then, of course, our transactable skill. We must be exceptional. Let me tell you something I wrote here, very important. I said your value decides your relevance. It is true. Now, not your relevance as created by God. Your relevance as demanded by this generation. When nobody is seeking you and placing a demand on what you represent, it is proof. It's a report card to you that you may not be valuable enough. The second thing I want to say about that I wrote here is be competent and excellent. Do not just be valuable. Be competent. Be excellent. These are magnets that will attract people. They will attract opportunities. They will attract resources to you. I tell you this truthfully. Pastors, apostles, prophets, do not, do not embrace a life of laziness and mediocrity just because the grace and the anointing of, of the Spirit of God is upon us. I challenge everyone, career people, uh, school children, um, and, 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 and those who are, are students, those who are workers, be exceptional. Make up your mind that you are going to pay the price and deliver at its peak. Get to the zenith of everything that you are capable of doing. And then you will attract reward systems in a way and a manner that will surprise you. I, I see this every day. I watch with shock and wonder how that people who have not contended for a threshold level of value continue to believe that reward systems will fish themselves into their lives. It's not going to happen. There's no superstition about living a rewarded life. It is a direct measure of your value. And your value must be such that it's needed and useful within the context of a civilization. It's not enough to say, I am valuable. Is your value needed? Is your value useful within the context of a generation, within the context of a civilization? This is very, very important. So don't forget the things we are dealing with. That number one, you must know God, right? Very, very important. And that number two, you must be a person of vision, a clear vision for your life. Number three, you must contend for mental transformation. 
And then number four, you must be extremely valuable, extremely valuable. Work on your skill, work on your ability. Let, let me challenge you, listen. Run away from premature manifestation. Oh, this is a message to my precious generation. Run away from preachers, listen. Apostles, prophets, leaders, business people. Pay the price to work on yourself. This generation is not patient with mediocrity. Once you miss your chance, your first opportunity to make the best impression is going to take you a long time for this generation to listen to you again. Men of God, some of the delay you are experiencing in your ministry may not be demonic. It is God's mercy to preserve you so that when you come out from that cave of Adulam, you can communicate a dimension of spiritual reality that will be a blessing. Run away from premature manifestation. I know we're in a social media world where it's very free to just float an Instagram page, a YouTube page, you know, and we want to sell and market everything. But look, let's get back to the fundamentals of success. The Bible says you can do nothing against the truth but for the truth. Competence will always pay. Mastery is the way forward in your profession, even spiritually. Praise the name of the Lord. Very quickly, the fifth, I have to rush because I, I'm going to pray for us at the end of this, this uh, broadcast. Number five, I'm catching my breath here to, to just let you settle down and listen to what I'm about to teach you as the fifth point. The fifth key that you will need to be able to rise to greatness and then to master... Um, influence to bless a generation is to understand and master relationships please write that down if you're writing the fifth key you must understand and you must master relationships forget about greatness and forget about influence in today's world when you do not understand the dynamics of relationships amos chapter 3 and verse 3 the bible says can two walk together it didn't say can two people, can two systems, can two companies, can a ministry, people in a ministry, can people in a business, can people in a family. There cannot be progress until there is agreement. Can two work together except they be agreed. The word agreed there means compatibility, similarity of belief systems, similarity of motivations and convictions. Very, very important. Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 20, very powerful scripture. I, I think I should, I should turn there myself. Um, Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 20, very, very powerful scripture. It says, he that walketh with wise men, my version says, shall be wise. Just for walking with wise men, you have gotten rid of foolishness in your life. He that walketh with the wise men shall be wise. It says, but a companion of fools, it didn't say will be foolish. A companion of fools will not only be foolish, will be destroyed. So destruction has a technology. When you walk with fools, fools here does not mean an insult. It's a description to sustaining a belief system, an ideology that is very inferior and destructive. Comes from culture comes from a life of mediocrity, comes from all kinds of motivations, that he that works with the wise, that means you want to live a successful life. You have to unashamedly break your pride and look for the company of wise winners and pay the price to be part of that company. It is true. He that works with the wise, the Bible says, will be wise, but the companion of fools shall be destroyed. Write this down if you're writing, please. Everything advances and multiplies on the basis of relationships. It takes a relationship between a man and his wife to have children. It takes a relationship between a man and the Holy Spirit to produce a supernatural life. It takes a relationship between board members in a company, leaders in a ministry, and, and all kinds of, of, of people. It takes networking to succeed in today's world. It is very important. Everything advances and everything multiplies 
on the basis of relationship. You move forward when the various organs in your body and systems in your body relate with one another. Your nervous system, your digestive system, your respiratory system, they work in synergy to move this organism forward. Very, very important. Relationships are investments. Please understand this. Relationships are investments by every definition. And so you want to really understand relationships, you must understand investments. When you put some money in a mutual fund or in an investment, you give it time. That means relationship is a product of time. You give it time and you allow your profits to accrue. And then you now begin to reap the benefits. You must be willing to invest in strategic relationships. Invest your resources, invest your honor, especially when you seek to relate with people who have results. Listen to me. Never try to meet great people at your terms. Never try to relate with great people at your terms. It is pride. When you want to relate with a great man, adaptation, a great mentor would say, is proof of honor. You must sustain the adaptability to be able to work with the limitations and the, the whatever it is, the, the, the extra luggages that come with great people. Some of them can be temperous. Some of them can be impatient. Some of them can be insultive. Some of them can be sarcastic. Some of them can be vocally arrogant. You must be able to forbear these things and adapt if you truly seek to receive of the gift, the riches of the greatness that, that is within them. This is very important. Elijah was a very temperous man, for instance, but Elisha followed him carefully until he got a double portion of that grace. It is very important. The disciples walking with Jesus, even though some of them were older than him, he would call them many times little children. Little children, do you have any catch? You can imagine how insulting that would be for people like Peter. But they made up their minds and they embraced him as touching what he represented. It's very, very important. Listen to me. Relationships are very important. The favor systems in our lives are relational in nature. We must sustain the grace and the ability to value relationships. Today, um, many of you, millions of you, truthfully speaking, without exaggeration, all over the internet have celebrated me and continue to celebrate me because of a destiny connection. I may not know some of you, but God sees my heart that I honor you with all my heart and I celebrate you for taking the thoughtfulness. Listen, let me teach you a lesson. If you find people who make you a big deal, if you find people who do not trivialize your relevance, please honor them. Please appreciate them. From the one who sweeps your house, the one who washes your clothes, the one who stands in prayer for you. Master the art of communicating honor to people as a principle of sustaining relationships. Do not trivialize the slightest show of honor. Not everybody in the world thinks Apostle Joshua Selman is a big deal. I'm sure that there are people who can look at me, you know, in the internet celebrating this, this man with all due respect and humility. And they may just feel, what is the big deal about him? I have profound respect for them. But when I find a people, and especially a generation, that decides to choose you as the voice of God to that generation and pledge their loyalty and support, it is, it is gross dishonor to take that generation for granted. This is why God sees my heart that I love every one of you and I appreciate and celebrate you. It is not Joshua Selman's birthday. It is the birthday of a generation. It is your birthday. We are celebrating um, the synergy of relationships that is ultimately leading to the revelation of the Christ. More than the exaltation of a man. More than appreciating the impact of a man to a generation. Relationships are important. God has blessed me today with profound relationships. God has honored me with wonderful friends, men and women of God, a company of, of profound people. You cannot imagine uh, during the lockdown, I've, have, I've had a bit of liberty, you know, to ease up the stress from my, my routine. As, as, as you know, I, I live a very busy schedule and I'm honored having that schedule to be able to go, you know, around the world just taking this gospel 
of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the lockdown has afforded me some opportunity to rest and then to connect with valuable friends. And, 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 and many times I talk with these people and we glean from the wisdom and the grace that God has supplied one for another. And it's amazing how my life has changed. Profound people, profound gifts that God has brought to my life. It is very important. I have been blessed. I consider myself to be one of the most blessed men and women of, uh, I said men and women, men, men of God in, in, um, in, 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 in the world because I have about, honestly speaking, and I say this sincerely from my heart, I have about the, the most loyal workforce that any man can have, sincerely speaking. I have about the most honest, truthful, diligent, committed workforce uh, these people will walk their lives to see to it that, that the glory of God is revealed in and through the ministry and then my life. And even as I'm speaking now, they know that I bless them with all my heart and I'm grateful. Grateful for their love, grateful for their commitment. Um, I, was, I was humorously shown some videos that were made by some of the uh, departments, you know, just celebrated me. And uh, I'm not a very emotional person, but I, I couldn't help you know, but just, just five tears coming down from my eyes, I was really, really touched. Relationships, do they mean anything to you? Or do you trivialize people? Are, are your relationships parasitic or mutually beneficial? This is very important. There are many people who come into the lives of people and just pray, pray on their gifts, pray on their influence, pray on their achievements, Pray on everything just for self-aggrandizement. And that is terrible. Relationships are very, very important. I bless God for granting me grace to relate with you. I bless God for granting me the honor to be able to relate with a generation. It's very important. It's an act of his mercy to me. No shadow you won't light up. Mountain you won't climb up coming after me oh. no wall you won't keep down lie you won't tear down coming after me that's my testimony there's no shadow you will light up mountain you will climb up coming after me oh. there's no lie you won't keep down Wall you won't tear down, coming after me. God has blessed me with great relationships. And I truly, truly want to use this opportunity to celebrate and appreciate everybody who has contributed to making my life what it is today. I am a product of many graces. I am a product of the endorsement of several people. I'm a product of the participation of many people. Let's go very quickly. Number six. The sixth point that I'll be sharing very quickly is that you must seek genuine spiritual empowerment. Let's hurry up. Genuine spiritual empowerment. I believe in impartation. Numbers chapter 27 from verse 18 to 20. I'll just give you the references. I may not um, quote them and may, I may not read them because of time. Numbers chapter 27, please. 18 to 20. And then Deuteronomy 34 and verse 9. It says that you should anoint Joshua, find Joshua and, and, you know, and Aaron and all of that and anoint them. Joshua was anointed, he had the spirit of God, but he was anointed. And that he told Moses to take some of his honor and give Joshua. Honor is a grace, it can be transferred. Very, very powerful. Psalm 89 from verse 20 to 24. Psalm 89, maybe I should turn... Uh, there just just for emphasis Psalm 89 I'll read it very very quickly Psalm 89 from verse 20 89 from verse 20 let me open my Bible here from verse 20 it says I have found David my servant with my holy oil have I anointed him it says with whom my hand shall be established my arm also shall strengthen him 
the enemy, because of the anointing now, the enemy shall not exact upon him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. I will beat down his foes before his face and plague them that hate him. 24, but my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him, and in my name shall his horn be exalted. There is immunity that comes when you are empowered. There is grace that comes when you are empowered. You must seek genuine spiritual empowerment. Now, there are people who just stop in the realm of intellect, in the realm of the flesh, and downplay the place of spiritual empowerment. It is risky and it is costly. Life is spiritual. Life is intellectual. I agree. I spoke about value earlier on, but life is very spiritual. And as the days progress, especially in this day and age, there is a need for divine assistance, divine empowerment. You need impartation and you need the place of the prophetic. Let me say this very emphatically. Now, I know respectfully speaking, and I hope I don't get into trouble saying this, but I know that there's been a lot of abuses and imbalances in the prophetic and apostolic ministry, especially across Africa. It's a sad reality that we may have to admit that there's been a lot of, um, there is a mix of all kinds of things. I agree, and I know God is helping us. However, please do not make the mistake of ignoring the place of the prophetic in actualizing the destiny of a man and in rising to a point where you are at the zenith of your kingdom relevance. The prophetic has always in scripture and will always play a very vital role. Hosea chapter 12 and verse 13. Hosea 12 and verse 13. It says, and by a prophet, the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt and by a prophet they were preserved. It's very, very important. Ezra chapter 6 and verse 14. At the end of this broadcast, I'll be making reference to this scripture as I pray for us. It's a scripture that has blessed me for many years. Ezra 6 and verse 14. It says, uh, and the elders of, of the land builded and they prospered through the prophesying, you know, of, of, of um, Haggai the prophet, Zechariah the son of Edo, and they built and, you know, and they, and they accomplished, they, they finished it. I think that, that that's the rendition. It is important. There is the place of the prophetic. Very important. There is the place of the prophetic where words are spoken over your life. I'm a product of many anointings. Words have been spoken over my life. And, and it's amazing how these words have changed me completely. I have had the privilege of men and women speaking over my life and, and my life has been transformed sometimes overnight by the power of the prophetic. Number seven. The seventh point that I'm going to give us on this, this privileged day of my birthday as a key to rising to a point of transgenerational relevance. The seventh point and very important is live a life of joy and gratitude. You want to influence a generation, you must live a life of joy and gratitude. A few scriptures, please. Habakkuk chapter 3 and verse 17 to 18. Habakkuk 3 and verse 17 to 18. It talks about the fig tree not blossoming, that even though there's no olive on the vine, and so on and so forth. They say, yet I will rejoice, and I will joy in the God of my salvation. We live in a generation that, you know, seems to endure sadness and gloominess. We have all kinds of emotional justifications. And please, please don't, don't misunderstand me. I know that people are going through several things. People have lost their loved ones through the pandemic, you know. People have lost money, people have lost opportunities, people have lost time, you know, and, and several things. But, but I want to encourage you, it's important for you to know that joy is very important in a believer's life. Very, very important. And gratitude. I have, I, have, I have said it again and again that ingratitude is one of the greatest causes of delay. I think even more than demonic oppression. A life that is not apt to notice the, the slightest show of grace and kindness from God. It is very important. I live a life of gratitude. This morning, uh, I was just blessing the Lord for my life and I lay flat on the, on the, on the floor and I, I was just rolling before him and I was just saying, Majesty, thank you. Look what you've made out of my life. 
is very important. There are many of you today, the doors of favor have closed over your life because you are not careful to be grateful. You are not careful to be grateful. Remember what God has done in your life. He said, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not, forget not his benefits. Never forget where God has taken you from. Never forget, don't allow the joy of the palace make you forget that once upon a time I didn't have food to eat. Once upon a time nobody would have placed a demand upon the grace of God on my life, you would say. Once upon a time I would be looking for 100 naira or 100 dollars or whatever currency it is in your region. Now look what God has made and done with my life. Right there where you are at home or wherever you're, you're watching from, can you just take a minute to say, Lord, thank you? Can you just take a minute to express your thanksgiving? When you are thoughtful, you will be grateful. Many people are not grateful because they don't think. They don't think. Lord, thank you. Thank you for Joshua Selman's life. I am honored for what you have made out of my life. Thank you, Jesus, for your mercy, for your favor. You have not allowed the desires of our enemies to come upon us. You have shown us great mercy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Keep telling him thank you. Bless the name of the Lord. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Mention everything he has done. Thank you for life. Thank you, O oh God. I may not have a job, but I have life. Thank you for the gift of good people. Thank you for well-behaved children. Thank you for a good wife. Thank you for a good husband. Thank you for granting me the anointing. Thank God for your membership. I know you are trusting God for greater membership, but thank God. Thank God for salvation. It is very, very important. Very important. Go ahead, just one minute. Lord, we thank you. We thank you. We are not careful. We are lavish, lavish, lavish. For the things that you have done, for the battles that you have won, we say thank you. To you be all the glory for a life that you have so blessed. You have invested your jealousy upon my life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. I live a life of joy and I live a life of gladness. Believe me, I can tell you this. You will never find me putting my hand on my chin wondering what's my life going to become. No, no, no. I live a very joyful life. I live a very grateful life. There are many things I'm trusting God to do in the ministry, to do in my life, and I thank God for the things he's doing. But I'm very careful to say thank you. I'm not ashamed, afraid to go on my knees. And listen, it is not only God you should thank, you must thank men. If you thank God alone, you are a hypocrite because God uses men to bless you. Daddy, thank you for what you have done in my life. Mommy, thank you. I have gotten, I think, sincerely without exaggeration, from night until this broadcast started, I think there's been at least maybe five or 6,000 text messages. I just had to plug my phone and just leave it charging and go to bed. And then I keep, you know, just, I've not even read more than 98% of the text messages. When I'm done and everything is settled, I may not be able to respond to everybody. But you can imagine, to have over 6,000 people, I don't know how many may be sending now all over the world. Millions of people saying thank you. Thanksgiving is powerful. It is the seed for more. When you stand before a door that refuses to open, it's not just to bind and cast. Thank God that he even brought you close to that door. I live a very grateful and a joyful life. When you live a grateful life and you live a joyful life, you will see dimensions of God's grace. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And he will direct your path in all your ways. In all your ways. Use today to thank God. Not just for Joshua Selman, but thank God for Jesus. Thank God for what he has made out of our lives. 
as frail as we are, as limited as we are, as imperfect as we are, look what he's brought out of our lives. Beauty and glory. Very, very important. Let me give us the last point. Number eight. The last key to influencing a generation is practice genuine love. Mm. Practice genuine love. I've done a teaching, What is Love? You may want to listen to it. It's a two-part series, very powerful. Please get it online and listen to it. There are four dimensions of love that I teach. That love, the Bible talks about the length, the breadth, the height of the love of God. That true, genuine love has passion attached to it. There cannot be genuine love when there is no passion. Number two, genuine love requires commitment. There is a commitment dimension to it. Number three, genuine love has pleasure to it. Love cannot just be an episode of pain. There is a pleasure dimension to love. And then finally, sacrifice. These are the four dimensions of love. Passion, commitment, pleasure, sacrifice. One more time. Passion, commitment, pleasure, sacrifice. But I submit to you that the highest and the noblest expression of love is not passion. It's not commitment. It's not even pleasure. It's sacrifice. We live in a generation, respectfully speaking, that is very obsessed about pleasure. And every time we cannot derive pleasure from a thing or a relationship, we usually just assume that there is no love there. But the highest and the noblest expression of love is sacrifice. John chapter 3 verse 16. For God so loved the world... He didn't just prove it by laughing around. He didn't just prove it by multiplying bread that he gave his one and only begotten son. Of course, now the first begotten of we the brethren. But at that time, the only begotten son that whosoever believes in him, the Bible says, should not perish but have everlasting life. John 15, when you read John 15 from verse 12 to 13, John 15. Let, let me read it for us very quickly. John 15 from verse 12. It says, this is my commandment, Jesus is speaking, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life. That means as far as the earth realm is concerned, there is no manifestation of love that is higher than this than a man laid down his life. Hear me, my precious generation. Hear me, dear people of God. Love is not just about what you get. Love many times may require you laying down your life. And I've pledged myself and my life to serve my generation in life and in death as God grants grace, that I will serve the purposes of the kingdom in this generation. And if it will cost me my life, like Paul, let it be for me that to live is Christ. And if I die serving his purposes, it will be with a smile and honor that it, it would be that I serve my generation and I serve the purposes of God. Your life must be poured out as a sacrifice. Enough of receiving from people. Make up your mind that others is now time for people to receive from you. To receive of your gift, to receive of your grace, your benevolence. Very, very important. First Corinthians 13 and verse 3. As we prepare to pray. First Corinthians 13 and verse 3. It says, Now there abided these three. Faith that moves mountains. Hope that maketh not ashamed. And love. The Bible talks about these tripartite forces. Faith. You don't have faith. There's so much you cannot do. Faith. The token of victory. Hope. That makes not a shame. And love. But it says the greatest. Please hear me. The greatest 
It's not miracles. Thank God for the grace of God upon my life in the working of miracles and signs and wonders. And I know that so many of you have been blessed on that wise. I have been humbled by the profound miracles that God continues to do in and through these hands and in and through this life. I thank God for the privilege and the opportunity to dispense the mysteries of the kingdom as committed to me by his majesty. But I submit to you that the greatest testimony I desire in my life is not that Joshua Selman was a miracle worker. The greatest testimony I desire in my life it's not that Joshua Selman raised the dead and, and brought miracles to homes, as important as that is. The greatest testimony I desire in my life is not that Joshua Selman is a man of depth and revelation. No, it's not that Joshua Selman is a man of excellence and so on and so forth. The greatest testimony I desire is that Joshua Selman walked with God as a passionate lover of God and a passionate lover of men. I don't use men. I love men. I love men. I don't just love God alone. Jesus Christ, he knows I love him with all my heart. But I'm telling you, I love men. I love every one of you following, listening, connecting with our various platforms. I love you with all my heart. I love you. I'm not only trying to use you to build a career called ministry. No. Love is palpable. In fact, did you know, I'm, I'm sure that my, my blessed parents are watching from Joss and, and my family members. I love you so much. I, I thank my mom and dad. I believe that they are watching and following and all my siblings, precious gifts that God has given me. Uh, please allow my bias. Let me just take a moment to bless this precious gift that God has given me in my life. Um, um, they, they are a big deal. They have loved me and believed in me. And I truly love and honor you with all my heart. I appreciate you. I, I bless God for my parents for being discerning enough to give me the name. Did you know that Selman means the way to love? What a name. What a precious prophecy. And it is my desire that I continue to live out that name. To love people genuinely. Listen. Let the era of selfishness, let the era of self-centeredness, whether it is from men of God, we men of God, or from business people, or in relationships, use this opportunity of this birthday to kill it completely. Nobody will applaud you for being a pest and, and taking from people. You must make up your mind that I'm going to be a lover of God and I'll be a lover of men and start Please start from your neighborhood. You really want to celebrate Joshua Selman? You send me financial blessings. I am grateful, but it, it, it may not be satisfying to me. You send me material gifts. I am grateful, but it may not be satisfying to me. The greatest satisfaction is to bless the Lord for me and then to be able to extend my ideologies and convictions by granting people access to these teachings and then to be able to share the love of Jesus to those around you. If you buy a bag of rice and share it for the people in your community and say this is to honor Joshua Selman's birthday, I love you and I bless God for you, I would have derived the greatest satisfaction from my relationship. It, there is only so much food I can eat. There is only so much money I can use. There is only so much I can do with influence and the accolades of men. But what if you do it to someone in the name of the Lord? This is my desire. Sacrifice. Live a life of sacrifice and do not be embarrassed about it. Precious generation, hear me. Do something for people that will make them remember you. At the end of this life, as I wrap up, it is not our sermons that will be remembered. It is not our intellectual prowess that will be remembered. He says, so teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. I live ever conscious of the gift of life that God has given me. And as I sat back this morning reflecting on my own life, thanking him for what he has done in my life, and the privilege is granting me to go to the nations of the world. You know, my heart bled so much when the lockdown came because of several meetings 
uh, that, that, that I was already scheduled to have and several people who had anticipated my coming. And let me use this opportunity to assure you those from all of those regions. I was to be in the UK again, South Africa again, the United States again, Canada again, Dubai and um, 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 Israel, Israel was already um, uh, uh, cooking up, and, and then um, a number of African nations, Kenya, uh, Zambia, Ghana, and some of them probably if the lockdown is lifted, I may still be able to honor them, but for many, I'm sure it may not be possible again. And then, of course, many meetings within the nation. I want you to know that by the grace of God is a debt I owe you, and God will grant grace it will be an honor to bring a divine visitation to those regions. And as soon as all this is done by the grace of God and, and uh, life's uh, normalcy returns as, as we anticipate, um, it would be an honor to visit these nations again and again and to bring this dimension of the kingdom, the power and the glory of God. Thank you. I love people and I pray that God will give us the heart of sacrifice. The heart to be able to lay down our lives for others. So that when all is said and done, it will not be that he was a millionaire or billionaire. It will not just be that he was an, a, an amazing preacher with intellectual prowess. It will not just be that he built a ministry that was global. That at the end of our lives, like Don Moen will always say, that there is just one thing that matters. Did I live my life for truth? Like Don Muen will say, that all my treasures will mean nothing. It is only what I have done for love's reward that will stand the test of time. I want to pray for you. This would be my birthday gift. The word that I have brought and the prophetic decree that will come upon you. Psalm 71 verse 21. This is the word that the Lord gave me for my own birthday. Every time I celebrate my birthday, the Lord gives me a word that becomes a compass for the next level of my life. And this was the word he gave me. And I'm sharing it with you, Psalm 71 and verse 21. Thou shall increase my greatness and comfort me on every side. Some versions say roundabout. Thou shall increase my greatness. A man's greatness can increase. A man's influence can increase. Thou shall increase my greatness. I want to pray for you now. Please, wherever you are in one minute, I'd like you to begin to pray and say, Lord, as your servant is a... For your name is great and greatly to be praised. I love you, Lord, and I lift my hands to worship you. Oh, my soul rejoice. Take joy, my King, in what you hear. And let it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ears. Are you praying? I'd like you to open up your heart. What do you want God to do in your life? For some of you, you are trusting God for a miracle. For some of you, you are trusting God for a breakthrough. Go ahead. I'm already in tears here just worshiping the Lord for what he's doing. Go ahead. Celebrate his majesty. Place a demand. Father, I open up my heart. Let this prophecy bring healing. Let this prophecy bring restoration. You have a sick person. Bring them before your screen. Take joy, my King. In what you hear. 
I let it be a sweet, sweet sound. Take the stage, Lord. Have your way. I'm just a vessel and nothing more. Lord, when you're done, please take the glory. I'm satisfied just to see you glorify. I'm satisfied just to see you glorify. Hey, I'm satisfied to see you glorify. Omnipotent Father of mercy and grace, Thou art welcome in this place. The anointing of the Holy Ghost is strong in this place, strong in your homes, your offices, strong in this place to change your life, to turn your life around. Carlos Cabarando Selicapaya. That anointing is coming to your home, coming to your body, coming to your spiritual life. Just breathe your name upon me. Breathe. Just breathe your name upon me. Breathe. Yon Hewa is your name. Breathe, Lord. Just breathe your name upon me. Breathe. Ah. Uh. Breathe your name upon me. Breathe. Kalabashalanda bradosiata. Just breathe your name upon me. Breathe. Yod hewa he is your name. Breathe. Just breathe your name upon me, breathe. Yes, Lord. Pray, don't be distracted. I'm giving you a piece of my secret place. It's more than a broadcast. It's, it's an initiation into a life of intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Majesty, we're praying. Majesty, your grace has found me just as I am. Empty handed, but alive in your hands. Hey. Majesty, your majesty, forever I am changed by your love, in the presence of your majesty. Forever I am changed by your love. It is true, like the songwriter would say, that Jesus is the answer for the world today. We live in times of turbulence, times of affliction, times of discouragement of all sorts, ranging from region to region. And we need to reintroduce Jesus to a dying world. We need to reintroduce to a world that has so neglected jesus we need to let the world know that passion for jesus pays in this life and in the life after matthew 22 and verse 37 here's what it says jesus said unto them 
thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, your soul, and with all your mind. You have to love Jesus with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. Your mind must participate in that love relationship. Your soul must participate in that love relationship. Your heart must participate in that love relationship. It is one thing to work for God. It is one thing to serve in the house of God. But it's another thing entirely to love Jesus. There are many people who are not passionately in love with Jesus. And he's reminding us again of the value, not just of church. You can love church. You can love preaching. You can love sermons. You can love Christian activities. You can even love heaven. You can love the throne room. But none of these is Jesus. It is not the throne we worship. It is him that sits on the throne. Hallelujah. And so this is a call to number one, pay attention to our relationship with Jesus. I did a teaching, I think a few months ago called, uh, maybe a few months or about a year or so ago, three most important things, very powerful teaching. Please search for that teaching and listen to it from the depth of your heart, with all your heart. And I thought that three things are most important in any man's life. Number one, the first of them in order of priority is your relationship with Jesus. Lose everything in your life, but if you have Jesus, you have everything. People have lost money. People have sadly lost loved ones. In, in the wake of the pandemic, people have lost businesses. They have lost means of livelihood, sadly. But then if you have Jesus, he is that one friend that sticks closer than a brother. He is the anchor. Hallelujah. But you have everything. We live in an arrogant world today where some trust in horses and others in chariots, some education, some business, some trust in money, political connections, etc. The Bible tells us, that the name of the Lord, listen carefully, only the name of the Lord is qualified to be called a strong tower. No military might, no military arsenal is sufficient to stand the evil of the times. Our military, as wonderful as they are globally speaking, can only resist physical enemies. They do not have the power nor the intelligence to confront principalities, powers, and the spiritual wickedness that reside in heavenly places. It takes our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ to be both saved and safe. Hallelujah. It's been my passion to the body of Christ for many years that we must be able to redefine our passion. We cannot generalize Jesus. We cannot throw him in the mix of church and religion and conferences and programs as wonderful as they are. Let this day be a call again to the body of Christ. We need to return to Jesus in our sermons, Jesus in our homes, Jesus in our hearts. More than well-meaning church activities, more than charity and philanthropy, more than all of the things that we do. If you do not have Jesus, it is true according to the authority of scripture that you do not have life. They say it in a very interesting way that no Jesus, no life. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Mark chapter 12 and verse 32. Jesus was having a conversation with a scribe, one of the scribes. And the scribe made an interesting statement that Jesus had to comment on. Mark chapter 12 from verse 32. And the scribe said unto him, Well, master, thou hast said the truth, for there is one God and there is none other but he. 33. And to love him with all the heart, listen carefully, and with all the understanding and with all the soul and with all the strength, and to love his neighbor as himself is more than the whole bond offerings and sacrifices. Here is a scribe saying to love Jesus with your heart and with your understanding is more than everything, everything together. Praise the name of the Lord. 
Are we together? Please pay attention. The Lord is granting us grace. To love Jesus with all your heart, with every sense of passion, is greater than achievements, is greater than real estate, greater than all sorts of businesses. If all I have is Jesus, I've got something more than gold. I will tell it to my world. Jesus is more than gold. Something more than gold. I have something more than gold. Something more than gold. I've got something more than gold. If all I have is Jesus, I've got something more than gold. I will tell it to the world. Jesus is more than gold. Once again, we present Jesus to the world. We may not claim to know everything about business. We may not claim to know everything about leadership. We may not claim to know everything about our sociology and civilization, but this one thing we know is that Jesus has been enthroned today and been made Lord and And for as long as we live, we will present him to our world as the only way, not one of the ways. This is based on the authority of scripture. The Bible presents Jesus to the world as the way, the truth, and the life. He says, no man comes to the Father except by him. There are ways. There are formulas. But the Bible tells us that when it has to do with the matter of eternity and destiny, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. For those who are lost, we present you Jesus, the Savior, King of love, and passion love and passion i'd like you to pray in one minute and cry for the grace and the passion to love jesus more than anything go ahead and pray more than anything more than anything you're my treasure my priority who can compare to you great is the measure of your royalty O morning star you truly are everything hallelujah there's a wonderful and powerful song we sing in this side of god's kingdom says Yeshua, Hamashiach, You have everything, everything, everything. My life, my intellect. Lift your hands, lift your voices. song says everything that I have and all that I am is yours how true how powerful everything you have my everything anoint my everything use my everything take all of me all of me you have my everything Take all 
all of me, all of me, Lord. You have my everything. Take all of me, all of me, all of me. You have my everything. Listen, you have my everything. You have my everything. Take my everything. I release my everything, say, take all of me, all of me, Lord, you have my everything, take all of me, all of me, Lord, you have my everything. You shall love the Lord Jesus with all your heart, all your soul. Listen, let me tell you. At the end of your life, truly, nothing else matters. Not the jobs, not the homes, not the houses, not the certificates, not the accolades. Those things only find their value in this life. There is only one thing you can take out of this realm. Jesus and your relationship with him. Hallelujah. This is my first message again to the body of Christ. And this will be my core message until the day that I see his face. Mm. All my days on earth, I will await. Listen carefully. The moment that I see you face to face. For nothing in this world will satisfy. Jesus, you're the cup that will run dry. Treasure of my heart and of my soul. In my weakness, you are merciful. Redeemer of my past and present wrong. The holder of my future days to come. So who is like you, Lord, in all the earth? Much less love and beauty and less worth. Here's the powerful confession. Nothing in this world will satisfy. Jesus, you're the cup that will run dry. He's the cup that doesn't run dry. He's the fountain of living water. Listen, the Lord is speaking to you. You're yet to make this decision for Jesus. As you watch this preacher, this one who has been shown mercy, here is the Lord speaking through my voice come to Jesus win that war win that war of destiny run to Jesus and you who is already in Christ this is a, a call to be established to love Jesus more than church to love Jesus more than ministry to love Jesus more than career to love Jesus more than man of God woman of God more than money more than fame more than titles None of these things compare. Jesus above, Jesus ever, Jesus only. Praise the name of the Lord. Very quickly, my second message to the body of Christ is to contend for effective living. It's been a burden in my heart. The apostolic ministry allows you the privilege of capturing and sharing the burden that is in the heart of the spirit per season per time and there is a higher call for effective living what does that mean living with intention and living with a purpose there are so many people including Christians well-meaning believers who spend their lives just allowing time to define what to do with their lives and destinies. Psalm 90 verse 12. We'll look at three scriptures very quickly. Psalm 90 and verse 12. A call to effective living. 
a call to living a life of purpose to live a life with intention psalm 90 verse 12 says so teach us to number our days the word number our days does not mean to count the days to be aware that you will not always have them a sense of awareness is what cultures you into living effectively as you know i had the great privilege to be mentored by this lifetime mentor who i honor in life and in death dr miles monroe and one of the things that he brought to the body of christ is a sense of purpose and a sense of effective living this call is especially to my generation of people there is a lot of visionless living men who just live and allow status quo to define what their lives should be it ought not to be so this is a call to live with intention it's a call to live with purpose hebrews chapter 10 please and verse 11 hebrews chapter 10 and verse 11 hebrews chapter 10 and verse 7 i beg your pardon verse 7 hebrews 10 and verse 7 then said i lo i come the bible says in the volume of the book as it is written of me not to freelance my life throughout my lifetime but to do your will oh god lo i come we just finished a powerful series on witnesses a two-part series please do well to access these teachings and listen to it that everyone lives today respectfully speaking many in their old age are full of regrets and stories counsels and advices that they have to give the generation of younger people why because they live their lives just allowing chronos the passage of time to define their lives it's time to stop living a visionless life and get back to purpose what is purpose it is god's expectation for my life i was so honored i still am you cannot imagine the amount of text messages without exaggeration i think it should be nothing less than maybe eight to nine thousand text messages so far from across the world emails and all of that I've, I've, i'm not sure i've even read up to uh, i just have a system in my phone that lets me know the amount of text messages it's i had to keep deleting and deleting and deleting just praying on the text messages and deleting from all across saying thank you that you were born thank you for your life i'm honored and privileged to be me but let me challenge you god never designed for just a few people to be superstars and trailblazers and history makers it is our corporate destiny in christ that the least of us would live an impactful life as you know long life is a blessing long life is a great desire but listen to me it is not how long you live that matters it is how effective jesus lived for 33 and a half years and the world is yet to recover from his impact I made up my mind that even if it's just a day i have left i will serve his purposes and serve my generation with the gift and grace of god that he has so lavishly invested upon my life you do not have to wait to be an apostle joshua selman right from where you are with what you have you can start using your life your gift to serve the purposes of god are we together there is a call to live effectively second timothy chapter 4 and verse 7 please second timothy chapter 4 and verse 7 paul mentoring his son timothy he was getting to the end of his days and here's what he said i have fought a good fight there is a bad fight a fight that leads to destruction a fight that negates the project of kingdom come is a bad fight a wasted life pursuing money pursuing fame pursuing mundane things where kingdom come and the revelation of jesus is not connected to he says i have kept the faith i have fought a good fight so living is a fight living is a race we must run this race the bible says with perseverance looking unto jesus the author and the finisher 
of our faith. I want to challenge everyone from our studio family and those following online, our global family, you must make up your mind. Forget about what has happened in the past. That from where you are and from now on, I will live my life with purpose and intention. Buy books. Go for knowledge. Minimize wasting your life. Minimize careless and rash living jumping from pillar to post just trying to make ends meet in the flesh the bible says except the lord builds a house are we together he says they labor in vain that build it except the lord watches over a city the watchmen watch it but in vain it is vain to wake up early the bible says and to sleep late in the night only to eat the bread of sorrow but he gives his beloved sleep it is only god who can give a man meaning and purpose i think it's lamentations 3 27 if i'm not mistaken let's have it and see i hope that is a scripture it says it is good that a man bear his yoke in his youth in any case you will bear that yoke but in your youth you have the advantage of strength and you have the advantage of time now is the time to make that spiritual investment now is the time to build now is not the time for premature manifestation. Let me talk to us, some of us who believe that we have the call of God upon our lives and are waiting and hoping and trusting for our seasons of appearance. We must trust God for grace to stay, to build the discipline that makes for mastery. We must learn the laws that make for success and learn it early. Success is time tagged. There is a timing to success. If you start early, you will excel if you start late you may not have the time to maximize your destiny listen carefully the unit of destiny is time whatever you give your time to you have given a portion and a part of your destiny to and you must ensure that you're investing the gift of your time to the things that truly matter there are many of us who have cheapened our times and our destinies we can give our time to just anything anything things that have no eternal value things that have no transformational value the second call this afternoon is a call to return to purpose a call to return to effective living our world is full of depressed people today respectfully speaking our world is full of frustrated people today angry people angry at themselves and angry at others hurting themselves and hurting others why because you see psychologists teach us that the key to fulfillment among other factors is progress if you cannot measure progress in your life you will be frustrated and being frustrated you will hurt others we must contend for progress that comes by discovering and walking in the fullness of purpose are we together praise the name of the lord number three very quickly and this is a very serious one that the lord has put in my heart it's a call for a greater sense of love and more importantly unity in the body of christ god has called me to be an apostle to my generation he's called me and given me that mandate my call is to the body of christ and i have been concerned personally at the growing trend of hatred the growing trend of disunity and divide that exists in the body it's always been there but it seems the margin is getting wider and there is a call to be aware of this and to make adjustments we must love the body and we must love everyone who is part of the body regardless the individuals regardless denomination for a very long time it's been division along the divides of first religion and then denominations now we have all kinds of of pseudo christian doctrines that are not necessarily supported by the integrity of scripture that continue to divide the body of christ the third call is a strong burden 
this has been a burden in my heart and as i travel from region to region ministering by the spirit i have been burdened to call the body of christ back to a place of unity there is so much that we can do together there are dimensions of god we cannot capture and reveal to the world as individuals the best of us can only be an effective member of the body but then i thought to take it a step further to suggest and recommend by the authority of scripture and by the spirit three keys that i believe will help to sponsor the unity of the body it is not enough to merely say the body be united to close the gap of the divide that continues to widen between us from denomination to denomination from men of god and women of god to men of god and women of god from christian individuals to their brothers and sisters but i prayed earnestly over this and the lord gave me three keys three very powerful keys that would help to promote unity in the body and i want you to pay attention if you are a man of god especially please pay attention these are the keys that we will need by the spirit of god to help achieve unity in the body number one the first key that will help to promote to sponsor to establish to maintain and to multiply unity in the body is a culture and a practice of honor as a value system we must reintroduce the culture of honor mutual honor let it become a value system in the body of christ if we want to see unity there never can be unity in the body of christ until we maintain as a spiritual value system the culture of honor for as long as we celebrate communicating dishonor to men and to women of god either in loyalty to mentors in loyalty to fathers in loyalty to denominations in loyalty to spiritual leaders we will only continue to widen this divide are we together paul was speaking and he said there is one lord there is one faith there is one baptism for a very long time we've had a promotion and respectfully speaking even among us men of god subliminally we have mentored sons and daughters mentees and prodigies to find pride in downplaying and demeaning other ministries other men and women of god who are not part of our local assemblies or local spiritual families is a dangerous communication that must change are we together my fear right now is for the younger generation who are looking up to us and i speak more particularly to my generation of ministers in as much as god has helped us and shown us mercy we have been quick to criticize the fathers we have been quick to call them names we have been quick to see their scars we have been quick to make claims as though we have the stamina to do more than them gradually the stage is already clearing up for us and as we are standing on the stage it is it is it is almost a thing of shame that our limitations and our lack of preparedness as far as global spiritual leadership is becoming clear and obvious that the time we have taken criticizing people should be the same time we would have invested in the spirit to build stamina are we blessed the the resurgence of the spirit of pride the resurgence of arrogance boastfulness a partisan spiritual partisan spirit it is getting beyond control and it does not matter if the divide favors me listen we must not make the mistake that esther was about to make in the book of esther when you read her man was out to destroy all jews anybody jew was a victim of her man's plot but for the time being esther by reason of the immunity that the palace provided for her did not care about the plot and what was 
happening and Mordecai gave a warning that must be a warning to our generation he says do not think paraphrasing that when they are done with us you will be saved just because you think there is an immunity it's always been my passion to raise people who look to God and love the body of Christ more than just unique expressions it is important we allow our unrenewedness and many times our complexes and sense of inferiority that can be solved through knowledge, through competence and through knowing who we are in Christ. We mix these things in ministry and we begin to create very sharp divides. Men of God, this is a call from God. We must be careful. Posterity will judge us if we raise sons and daughters, we raise proteges and mentees that begin to insult the body of Christ it is no news that the body of Christ is like a bride that is growing we have to be careful the practice of honor listen our sense of honor must not just be to fathers and mentors senior colleagues in life and ministry or spiritually speaking the Bible mandates that we honor all men that we honor all men first peter chapter 2 please and verse 17 first peter chapter 2 we must communicate honor to fathers and mentors in the faith first peter chapter 2 and verse 17 we must communicate honor and love and recognition to the fathers of faith can i tell you this a father does not have to be accurate necessarily in terms of flawlessness to deserve honor the status of being a father mandates that they have their honor in life and in death and then you must also honor your contemporaries many times we honor the father and dishonor our contemporaries and then many times we honor the fathers we honor our contemporaries but we disregard the younger ministers who are coming there is a growing trend of disregarding younger ministers mentees prodigies we were once like them even as we remain sons to fathers and so we must have the fortitude to help these people they will make mistakes they will do foolish things one of the cross of fatherhood true fatherhood is the ability to take a lot of nonsense from sons while you allow them grow honor must be a culture and a value system that must be reintroduced to the body of christ marketing of 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 um making making a proposal that prides in limiting people especially the fathers of faith we must be careful it's often said on easy lies the head that wears the crown the average person does not know the kind of attacks and the onslaughts of darkness that attempt to to plague anyone who becomes a bearer of the cross and the name of jesus christ we must pray for the body and we must communicate honor are we together so the first key this is my proposal based on the, the integrity of scripture to the body of christ to help us attain unity there must be a sense of mutual honor honor cannot be one-sided alone it can't just be from a son or a daughter to a father no the son or the daughter is also god's creation and they deserve honor in their own regard the fathers deserve their honor contemporaries deserve mutual honor one to another honor that is vocally expressed that matches the degree of honor they receive themselves and then honor to our subordinates this also extends to business people those in office fathers today were one sons yesterday sons today will be fathers tomorrow children yesterday and babies yesterday will be sons or children today will be sons tomorrow and fathers the day after we must practice a culture of honor honor that is beyond membership size honor that is beyond the level or quality of anointing 
honor that is beyond soundness in doctrine in as much as all of these things provide an edge in themselves but we must communicate honor that is a value system intended to help the body of christ provide unity you will hardly criticize somebody you truly celebrate and you acknowledge the hand of god upon can i tell you this nobody who loves jesus and names the name of christ will intentionally intentionally refuse to give his best as far as the building of the body is concerned it is true that we will observe mistakes it is true that we will observe faults there will be flaws in terms of doctrinal accuracy in terms of administration in terms of personal alignments we are different there's no confusion about that we are not at the same levels of the anointing we are not at the same levels of doctrinal perceptions we are not at the same levels of organization and results this we must admit however in the midst of all of these things we must obtain grace from god to look beyond it i should be able to sponsor buses for a crusade even though i do not necessarily know the man of god i can say look this is a contribution coming from a brother and a co-laborer may the lord bless that crusade it does not have to be by my assembly to receive my support are we blessed this is a very serious end time call to the body of christ for as long as we continue to celebrate individual successes and let me give a word of caution with all due respect to sons and daughters we also are sons ourselves but to sons and daughters we must be careful so that we do not in a bit to show loyalty and honor to a mentor a father we do not begin to bring all kinds of negative constructions narratives that continue to plant enmity among men of god among christian leaders that must stop the the ministry of sons is to uphold the hands of fathers even as they uphold christ whilst they learn and grow not to be the sources of divides is that true first recommendation the practice of mutual honor and i can tell you there are many fathers in this nation in africa and across the globe who even though they are men and women who god has helped with all of their status their achievements spiritually and otherwise they have been able to stoop down and communicate lavish honor to sons this man standing before you is one of the benefactors of that rare communication of honor that has come from fathers and just as they have honored us we must maintain the fortitude and the humility to be able to communicate the same to them to our contemporaries i have taught our global family you belong to this global spiritual family i have taught you again and again we do not talk about men of god to destroy them we challenge wrong doctrines we help the body mature but throwing down a man of god insulting a man of god tearing down a man of god destroying his family is not an advocacy that represents our values we love Jesus, we love the body. An imperfect body, yes sir. A body that is growing, yes sir. And this will remain our apostolic advocacy that if we desire to see kingdom come and we desire to see Nigeria and Africa present Jesus afresh to the world, it will not just come by our prowess in doctrines. Knowledge can be limited. But love and unity of the faith of the body that comes through mutual honor number two the second key that can help to unite the body of Christ is understanding authority with jurisdiction the second key very quickly is understanding authority with jurisdiction I wish I had time to teach on this this is just a broadcast according to scripture authority the administration of authority is jurisdictional you do not have authority when it has to do with functioning in the cosmos you cannot legislate everywhere if you are legislating as a kingdom ambassador within that capacity you have authority over creation but when it has to do with human relations there is jurisdiction to authority i cannot go on the street 
and begin to discipline any child I see. He is not my child. If for any reason I think that child deserves discipline, there are law enforcement agents. It is this lack of jurisdiction to authority that continues to bring a divide in the body. Any man of God can stand and talk about anybody. There is a protocol and there is jurisdiction to administering authority. We must teach our sons, we must remind ourselves, and we must learn from the fathers. The jurisdictional component of authority. This is a spiritual family, Koinonia Global. And everyone within that fold, it is within my spiritual jurisdiction to correct, to rebuke, to admonish, are we together now but i do not have the right exclusively to jump into another man's ministry or jump into another man's business or jump into another man's family or jump into another man's political career and begin to veto authority it's not done that way there is a protocol the bible says when you come into a man's house your first assignment is to knock and wait until the owner of the house receives you if he does receive you this is doctrine if the owner of the house receives you then let your peace rest upon him but if he does not receive you you do not have authority as far as that house is concerned this lack of jurisdiction is what gives us a lot of spiritual pride to do a lot of things a young boy for instance you imagine someone at my level of ministry for instance now beginning to talk about fathers of faith world over across africa by what authority it is true that we are in christ but don't forget that even the heaven you are talking about was built on the foundation of 12 apostles there is still order in heaven even though satan is not there the government system of heaven recognizes men. There are rankings and there are authorities. Even in the practice of law, there is what we call a jurisdictional component. Is that true? There are times that issues around are beyond a jurisdiction and they will hand it over. Even in the practice of medicine, there are times that a doctor, even though a professor, he will admit that this is not my area of specialty. And because of that, let me hand it over to a consultant pediatrician, a consultant gynecologist. They excel because they understand jurisdiction. The military use the same system. A commanding officer in a particular theater or cantonment cannot get up and go just like that and begin to command a battalion without permission. There is a ranking system. This is true in the body. As far as the body being an army and apostolic leadership is concerned, we have to understand the jurisdictional component of authority. Authority is not without jurisdiction. Whilst Jesus walked on earth, did you read a place in scripture where he took somebody out of one city into another to pray for the person? Jesus himself honored the powers that be we have to be careful let's be careful as we speak about and against the powers that be political powers economic powers the bible says to submit to authority we have a right to observe leadership flaws we have a right to correct things that are within our jurisdiction but there is a protocol to administering authority we must submit ourselves and return to the doctrinal pattern of administering authority this is the second key to helping close that gap of divide in the body of Christ. The third, very quickly, is God helping us. The third key that will promote unity in the body of Christ is called forbearance. We must practice forbearance. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 12. Let me tell you what forbearance is. Forbearance is creating a psychological system of accommodation for the weaknesses the limitations the imperfections the flaws in perspectives as far as human relations is concerned is called forbearance forbearance is more than forgiveness forbearance means that limitation will happen again and again and again may god forbid it but assuming i'm an angry person you see that if you want to live with me you will not need to forgive me for anger because it will happen again. So you have to create a system of accommodation that this is a weakness 
that will happen again and again this key will keep homes in peace this key will keep churches and members pastors and members in peace there is no perfect vessel anywhere no the key to receiving from men of god from business people from leaders both political and spiritual is to have the fortitude for forbearance forbearance do we have okay i thought we had the scripture projected we must practice forbearance it's more than forgiveness forbearance it will happen again and again again and again one time i was talking to i was counseling a very wonderful couple and um the man had done something against his wife and then they were together and i was talking with them and the man you know apologized to the wife and said i'm sorry and he said it will never happen again and i laughed i said hey, 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 hey. let me step in it will happen again madam while this man is sorry and working on himself you will see many episodes of these kinds of things create a system of accommodation through revelation so that your joy is not tied to his transformation let his transformation be an added advantage not the basis of your joy forbearance as men of god as leaders we are different different in our understanding about life there are some who are on the arrogant side there are some who are on the shy side there are some who are on you know insecure there are some who are confident even overconfident there are all kinds of people god has chosen to use us as weak and as frail as we are we must forbear there are people you don't have forbearance also means you don't have to agree with someone to work together even though the bible says can two work together is speaking in the context of destiny do not fight people simply because you don't agree with their perspectives there are many wonderful friends i have across the globe and we may not agree 100 percent in everything in terms of doctrine or approach to ministry but that is not enough reason to be so antagonistic to one another listen we must maintain that culture of forbearance i have the privilege and the honor of preaching across different denominational divides and it's been a culture i have trained myself to understand that every time i go to a ministry i preach across denominations i must have the flexibility and the adaptability to walk around their protocol of operations now as koinonia and as a man of god i have my convictions i have my modus operandi i have a way i believe ministry should be done i have a way i believe life should be lived but i must sustain the the faculty of accommodation are we together now we must be careful if the whole world is koinonia we will never produce the will of god let me tell you we can only be a an effective dimension of God if you want to see all of God then it cannot be koinonia alone there are many other ministries across this nation across Africa and across the globe that God is equally using mightily more superior in approach more superior in power more superior in doctrine our assignment is to be faithful within the jurisdiction of that which has been committed unto us to do it and serve god and serve this generation with our lives are all in life and in death this is our assignment so we have to be careful because this this doctrine of outshining this doctrine of demeaning is where we have this lack of forbearance we are quick to observe mistakes we go back respectfully speaking to our orthodox assemblies and we see our reverends our fathers veterans of the gospel men who have served jesus even before some of us were born and we dare have the audacity to challenge them based on whatever factors we have put together and we think just because we have people clapping for us while we are misleading ourselves it does not mean we are making progress we must return back to the spirit of forbearance regardless our limitations jesus is still in his church and the bride of christ is still the bride of christ is god helping us i have shared three keys among many others as a proposition all i have done is an attempt a communication of my passion as a man of god to help bring the body of christ to unity let me observe the following before 
we are done with this point unity does not mean uniformity we will never do the same things no 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 unity does not mean the same approach unity does not mean the same level of accuracy unity means the same goal the same goal the same goal that even in our limitations it must be seen that our desire is for jesus to be lifted jesus you be lifted higher higher be lifted higher that's our one goal jesus you be lifted Let our King be lifted up, oh, oh, Listen to me. I look forward to times in this body of Christ where men of God can hold hands together and rejoice and celebrate regardless of who works miracles or who does not regardless of who has revelation and who does not i look forward to times where sons and daughters will have mutual respect one for another regardless of who has seen what who has had a vision who has who is a prophet who is an apostle regardless who is a millionaire who is a billionaire regardless who is Igbo, who is yoruba who is north a northern man, who is whatever it is and i believe that in my lifetime it is my prayer and my desire that we'll see a heightened sense of unity. And I pray that somehow the Lord will breathe upon this broadcast and send it by his angel like he has always done to homes, to ministries, to churches, to cathedrals as an attempt, a token, a contribution to help build the unity of the faith. Can I tell you this? We will differ in terms of our passion for God we will differ in terms of our levels of hunger and pursuit we will differ in terms of the time and the space we have given god to build us our covenants of alignment our levels of press into spiritual things will create an obvious spiritual potential difference but we must learn to look beyond our achievements we must be able to hold hands and pray and hug one another we must be able to stand upon the pulpit and preach jesus not tearing down one another we must meet together with sons and daughters and lift up the name of jesus and promote love and honor for the body the reason why respectfully speaking the secular society has the audacity to now begin to look down and demean the church and to demean men and women of god is that there has been an allowance a template has been created within the body itself that demeans itself any man who does not show his own house honor any woman who does not show her own house honor will have even neighbors and people around come and and look down on them let us restore the honor that comes with being a christian let us restore the honor that comes with lifted with lifting wounded soldiers let's restore the honor that, that the honor of priesthood that anybody who names the name of christ sincerely with the intent to see jesus lifted and to see jesus glorified that sacrifice is deserving of our honor in life and in death can i tell you this this is a kingdom where you may be right but you will still not win we only win when jesus is lifted are we blessed Take it higher for me. I want to sing this song very quickly. It says, Lord, make us instruments. You know that song? Of your peace. Where there is hatred, let your love increase. Lord, make us instruments. Of your peace. The walls of pride and prejudice shall cease when we are your instruments of peace 
So very quickly, to attain unity in the body of Christ, among many other factors, is number one, and a very key one, a recap now, mutual honor. Mutual honor. I pray for you. You pray for me. Hold on. I shouldn't pray for you alone. The song says, I pray for you and you pray for me also. I can't be praying for you alone. Uh -uh. Because I also need prayer. We're going to sing it one more time. I need you to. That's a very, that's a statement that takes a lot of humility to admit in our arrogant world of emoji, millionaire, billionaire. We act as though humans are not God's creation. I pray for you. You pray for me. I love you. I need you to survive. I won't harm you with words from my mouth. I need you to survive. It is His will that every need is supplied. You are important to me. I need you to survive. Listen. Do not act as if we do not need business people we need them to fund the gospel we need politicians to bring policies that make for kingdom come yes we believe in divine health but we need doctors who continue to midwife our health while we are learning and growing in the school of the spirit we need apostles we need prophets don't tear down the prophetic ministry just because of imbalances here and there there are genuine men called and a territory that rejects his prophets and apostles will reject the roadmap for the future. We need evangelists. We need our stadiums full again of men and women who call upon the name of the Lord. We need pastors who teach and raise and mentor and train. And every one of these people, regardless the capacity, Oh, by the way, we also need workers in church. We need faithful workers. Ordained and not ordained, as we call it. We need workers. No matter how anointed a man of God is, you do not have those who lift your hands. You will suffer as if God did not call you. Everyone who is a contributor to kingdom come deserves honor. Don't look down on your security man while appreciating your spiritual father that's a hypocrisy don't look forward don't appreciate the kingdom millionaire giving you millions and billions and looking down on your ushers the protocol and all the people sometimes i come for meetings and i am preparing for service i come and i find all these my wonderful people the sacrifices and the things that they do i never would be able to do that you're watching me from around the world. There are brains who have sacrificed their lives, their intelligence to make this happen. How could we take all the glory and act as though we are the single exclusive factor in making Christ lifted? No. There are many other people. Oh Jesus, it is true that you died, but Joseph of Arimathea gave you his grave. Simon of Cyrene helped you carry the cross. Don't forget the women and John who encourage you. The Bible captures all of them in the story because they deserve honor. So even though he is king of kings, but he does not downplay and demean everybody who played that role. This is a call to us pastors, leaders, great people, both in business and in ministry. Let us be very intentional about communicating honor. Let us stop some of those speakings that make it look like we can do with or without them no the only person we can do without or we cannot do without is Jesus but then when it has to do with walking on earth and getting results we need men the Lord gave the word great is the company of them that published it I'm doing a quick recap honor and then number two understanding 
the jurisdictional component of authority and then the spirit of forbearance oh i pray that that baptism will come upon the body of christ the spirit of forbearance forbearance create a system of accommodation for the limitations of people some things are not weaknesses they are just personality differences there are people who till jesus comes their vocal expression in the similitude of pride will remain so their personalities are like that they will not change there are others who are largely introverted and they look very simple and humble leave them the way they are that way if it is a character challenge we'll continue to contend for transformation but if it's a personality difference we must embrace it and trust god for grace that in the midst of it somehow jesus will be glorified and jesus will be lifted are we together praise the name of the lord so we've discussed three issues now very quickly number one is the love for jesus number two is effective living living with intention and living with purpose number three is bringing about love and unity in this precious body of christ now number four is my gratitude koinonia global thank you body of christ thank you America, thank you. Europe, thank you. Listen, it's one thing to be called and anointed, but it's another thing to have people receive you. The Bible says, he came to his own and his own received him not. It's possible to be genuine and yet not received by a territory. So I thank you for receiving me. I thank you for giving your best there are mothers that pray for me world over there are individuals that pray for me world over i may never know some of you there are many of you who are the lifeline behind the exploits it is joshua selman that is seen but i'm wise enough to know that some of the results in my life are more than just my spiritual press is the intercession and the advocacy of nameless faceless hundreds thousands of people there are several ministries across this globe prayer groups who have spent days praying and fasting for me i may never have the opportunity to tell them thank you i may never have the opportunity to sit at table with them but i want you to know that this man you see who god has helped is grateful i am grateful thank you for your love thank you for your forbearance i want to appreciate very particularly our fathers of faith in this nation we thank you for your mentorship your leadership access to your platforms access to your churches thank you for your programs the conferences i want to say a very big thank you to our senior mentors our senior contemporaries or our senior uh, men of god in ministry and in business and in politics I had the honor and the privilege of spending a few hours with a greatly revered mentor yesterday and it was a life transforming moment two to three hours of imparting knowledge that has given me the course for the next say 10 to 20 years of my life it was isaac newton at the end of his life after he formulated the whole theory of his mechanics he made a statement and he said if i have seen further than others it is because i have stood on the back of giants our fathers and our mentors are these giants and let me say to our fathers that i know that you have been greatly dishonored by our generation of sons but there are still a remnant who understand honor we love you for who you are we celebrate you for what god is doing in your life we continue to follow you as you follow christ Thank you for showing us your scars. Thank you for showing us your limitations. Thank you for being open and secured enough to lead us. In the name of Jesus. Let me say a big thank you to all of my contemporaries in ministry. I have enjoyed unusual honor. 
honor i cannot begin to mention names from europe to the us asia africa nigeria i have enjoyed profound support and prayer the good word the good will the sacrifices that contemporaries in ministries have made and continue to make co-laborers thank you i do not take your love for granted i am truly grateful now let me appreciate all those who look up to me and look up to our generation of leadership thank you for your forbearance thank you for your sacrifice we call you sons and daughters only because god has shown us mercy and in the name of jesus christ to every true son every true daughter every prodigy every mentee and every one who looks up to us for spiritual direction and by any means if you have found anything worth emulating in my life and in this ministry to koinonia global this precious family that i live for and i will die for as i serve the purposes of god accept my thanks for everything you have done you have made leadership spiritual leadership easy thank you in the name of jesus christ i want to more particularly celebrate the workers in this ministry thank you azaria family abuja family and by extension koinonia global there are many people who have been the instruments that have taken my teachings from nation to nation from region to region did you know that other ministries have sacrificed a portion a portion of their ministry to sit with that our teachings and what that deposit of christ that he has put reaches the nations how could we be so ungrateful thank you thank you to you thank you for all those who give you give and you support this work from across the globe i am amazed and even humbled at the passion to support the passion to stand by me as i lift up the name of jesus thank you all our prayer warriors listen i have i have a team of faceless prayer warriors but i have a team of others that i know you may never know them they are the annas in the temple these are the people behind the exploits that god is doing in and through my life and i want to thank you thank you everyone and my own commitment is that for as long as there is breath in my life we will preach jesus and we will see that he's lifted from nation to nation i have come to a point in my life like the apostle truly where for me to live is christ and if i die in this gospel it is gain let the name of the lord be praised let the name of the lord be glorified be lifted high be lifted high oh lord be lifted high for you are holy righteous and worthy oh lord be lifted one more time we lift you high be lifted high be lifted high oh lord, oh lord. one desire my greatest purpose in life is not to be a good preacher believe me my greatest desire in life is not to be a celebrity no my greatest desire in life is not to have the largest church the largest ministry in all fairness my greatest desire is that I'm able to use my life and even my lifetime as a drink offering to be able to reveal Jesus to my generation and to bring him glory and then to also inspire a generation to love, to serve, to seek 
and to pursue Jesus. That's it. No matter what else works in my life, if this fails, I failed. But no matter what fails in my life, if this worked, I won. This is the template that governs my life. More than some of the things that drive us. It is a reason why you would notice that, respectfully speaking, I am very disconnected to several things that seem to each people in our generation. Not, I don't have any particular bias against love and want of these things, but it is the extent of my determination to live a life that allows Jesus to be revealed and glorified. God has so worked in me honoring that desire and disconnected me from several things that seem to be an obsession for people. So my first message today to our global family and then to the family of believers and as many who are connected. This has no prejudice or bias whether you are a Christian or Muslim. These are truths that will improve any life at all. Any life that cares to listen. Connect your desire for wealth to purpose. Use purpose to vet your desire. Use purpose to prune your desire. Use purpose to prune your pursuit. Ask yourself that question. Why am I doing the things I am doing? Because, you see, the way we live our lives and the way we make it a do or die affair for everything. It is because the motivation may be wrong. When you connect your life to purpose, and if that purpose is to reveal and to glorify Jesus, I assure you that many things in your life will no longer be a do or die affair. My first message, the power of purpose. You must answer the question, why? Why am I obsessed about wanting to be rich? Why am I obsessed about wanting to be the man of God everybody sees? Why am I obsessed about having the largest or greatest or most impactful ministry? Why do I want to become the businessman that everybody sees? Why do I want to become the politician that everybody sees? What is the obsession behind becoming a celebrity? Our world is full of great people who kill themselves, committed suicide, even at the height of supposed successes. Why? Because they did not connect their pursuit to purpose. Jesus revealed, Jesus glorified. Remains the anthem for my life and the anthem for this ministry. In the name of Jesus Christ. Number two. The second thing I want to talk about in this broadcast. That the Lord placed so strongly in my heart. I had to pray this for my own self even before bringing this is the purity of heart write it down please the purity of heart these are not the kinds of messages that you easily hear in the body of christ again sadly the purity of heart matthew chapter 5 and verse 8 there is a powerful blessing that is connected according to scripture to purity of heart matthew 5 and verse 8 let me turn it here matthew 5 And verse 8, it says, blessed are the pure in heart. You know the blessing? It says, for they shall see God. Very powerful scripture. Not blessed are the believers. Not blessed are those who fast. Not blessed are those who pray. Not blessed are those who go to church. Not blessed are those who preach. This very blessing is connected to those who are pure in heart what does it mean to be pure in heart jesus looked at a man called nathaniel and he said nathaniel when they called on nathaniel this was a man who was even doubting the ministry of jesus and yet jesus said an israelite indeed in whom there is no guile that is the definition of being pure in heart to be pure in heart is not about perfection and blamelessness to be pure in heart is that intrinsically you are void and free of guile falsehood deception 
and wickedness that's what it means to be pure in heart and the Bible says the blessing is they shall see God you know what that means it doesn't just mean they shall have visionary encounters of God they will always see God manifest in their situation why because whether they are right or wrong the purity of their heart sustains an attracting power so you can find people who doctrinally are wrong as far as the pursuit of purpose are wrong and yet God seems to show up in their lives because the, there is a blessing that those who are pure in heart will see God they will see God show up they will see God step in they will see God arise for them that means they will never be left in shame because of the purity of heart is someone learning Proverbs chapter 16 let's read from verse 16 to 19 Proverbs 16 16 to 19 but the verse of emphasis is verse 18 Proverbs chapter 16 from verse 16 to 19 Proverbs 6 I meant to say Proverbs 6 16 to 19 6 16 to 19 watch this it says a proud look these six things that the Lord hate and seven are an abomination to him so the Lord hates this number one a proud look number two a lying tongue number three hands that shed innocent blood number four a heart that devised wicked imagination that's it right there feet that be swift to running to mischief 19 a false witness that speaketh lies and he that soweth discord among brethren that these six things and seven the lord is saying i personally hate it back to verse 18 it says a heart that devised wicked imagination this is a heart that is not pure and let me tell you you can be a believer and still have this kind of heart you can be a preacher and still have this kind of heart a heart that intrinsically devised wicked imagination one of the reasons why God judged the earth in the days of Noah it was more than just that they were sinners it was that the heart of man was perpetually devising wickedness and imagination purity of heart we can have I wrote here we can have good and even godly activities but are inspired by wrong or corrupt motives you can have a very godly activity as a man of God as a businessman and yet because your heart is not pure it will not bring the blessing that should come with it I'm reminded of John chapter 12 the first six verses very classic scripture that reveals to us the corruption that is intrinsic within the heart of man the Bible says then six days before the Passover came six then Jesus six days before the Passover he came to Bethany where Lazarus was which had been dead whom he raised from the dead we're reading to six verse two he says and they made him a supper and Martha served but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him verse 3 the Bible says then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard very costly and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment now watch the reaction the Bible says then saith one of his disciples Judas is Cariot, Simon's son which should betray him why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor very good activity if you were to judge him by that statement you would say what a lovely man who loved the poor but the bible is quick to tell us verse 6 that this he said not that he cared for the poor but because he was a thief this he said not that he cared for the poor but because he was a thief and had the bag 
and bear what was put that means he was using a very good statement but he was to achieve a selfish reason unfortunately there are so many in the body of christ today if you judge by what they are saying if you judge by what they are doing you will say it is true but behind the scenes is a corrupt and a wicked heart that is not pure at all are we together purity of heart this he said not that he cared for the poor this he said not that he cared for the lost this he said not that he cared for the ignorant this he said not that he cared for the confused this he said not that he cared for the body of Christ but because he was a thief purity of heart I have met some of the worst of the worst people you can think and I've had the honor of sitting down with some of them smokers liars all kinds of terrible people and I am amazed sometimes at the depth and the extent of purity that is in their heart in the height of the supposed decadence around their lives once you shift beyond that veil you will find out that this is a sincere person I have met idol worshippers I have met supposedly wicked people and then when you sit with them and vet them you even use their own life to repent but I have met people who are masters of communication as ministers as business people I have met powerful people I have met great people I've met all kinds of great people honorable people and yet in the midst of it you find out that there is corruption within their heart it is my prayer first for myself for you for our global family please let's honor Reverend Sam Oye thank you thank you thank you God bless you for your presence sir hallelujah are we together blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God blessed are the pure in heart there were a group of people in the Bible that every time Jesus met he always reached out to them because although they were sinners they were pure in heart he met the woman at the well he saw a woman with a terrible life but beyond that layer she was pure in heart he met Nicodemus and he saw that he was pure in heart but there were a few people who were always at his crusades always at his programs and yet because they were not pure in heart they never received anything my second message to the body of Christ is that we must return to the purity of heart genuinely desire the good of all and the good of the body write this down genuinely desire the good of all and the good of the body genuinely desire the good of all and the good of the body i wrote here do not wish for anticipate and even support the downfall or the destruction of anyone in the body of Christ do not wish for do not anticipate and do not even support the downfall or the destruction of anyone in the body Luke chapter 2 and verse 14 see what happened to the earth as Jesus was born Luke chapter 2 not Leviticus Luke 2 14 it says glory to God in the highest and on earth peace and goodwill towards men because Jesus was born he said this is the consequence glory to God in the highest and on earth there should be peace and goodwill towards men Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10 Galatians 6 and verse 10 Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10 it says as we have as we have therefore opportunity let us do good unto all men especially unto them who are of the household of faith don't sit down and wish for any church any man of God 
any ministry any assembly and you anticipate evil and rejoice when it happens that is that is lack of purity of heart it says the pure in heart will see God hallelujah yeah. once upon a time Jesus sent the disciples towards Jerusalem the Bible says and then when they went there they were not received and Jesus was surprised and the disciples came and said listen should we call down fire on them as Elijah did remember Elijah was a no-nonsense man and Jesus turned to them and rebuked them and said do you not know what spirit you are of that means what is the meaning of that purity of heart every time I pray I ask the Lord I say beyond being a preacher may my heart be sincere towards you and towards men is someone learning because there is a growing absence of the purity of heart sadly even within the body of Christ the degree to which we enjoy we celebrate and even promote the pain of others is becoming alarming and there has to be a system of managing and curbing this it's an attack on the de on, on the body of christ by the devil purity of heart wish for the good of all wish for the good of everyone in the body do not wish for anticipate or even support the downfall or the destruction of anyone in the body number three the third message i have first for us and then it extends to the body of christ this is an emphasis the unity of the body i truly believe that among the many assignments that the lord has given me this is one of my core assignments to the body to be a contributor to attaining this state of unity within the body Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 13 please let's hurry up Ephesians 4 and verse 13 this is the reason why he gave unto some apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers he says till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the son of god unto a perfect man he says unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of christ the unity of faith the unity of faith very 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 powerful scripture romans chapter 12 from verse 4 romans chapter 12 it says for as we have many members in one body and all members have not the same office take note of that so we being many are one body in christ and every one members and every one members one of one of another verse 6 we're reading to 8 having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us whether prophecy let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith seven or ministry let us wait on our ministering or he that teacheth on teaching verse eight it says or he that exhorteth on exhortation he that giveth let him do it with simplicity he that ruleth with diligence he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness You've heard me say there are dimensions of God and in God that can never be captured and revealed by a single individual. No matter how yielded, no matter how anointed, there are dimensions in God made for the profiting of the body that no single individual, no matter how aligned, you just cannot. It is not part of God's system no matter how yielded we are joshua selman cannot be listen if the whole world becomes a reflection of joshua selman's work with god the world is going to be an incomplete and imbalanced spiritual place because no matter how i love god no matter how yielded i am there are dimensions that will not be given to me yet are needed for the body we must admit this as men of God unashamedly 
and then be open to embrace dimensions that are needed and useful for the body but are not captured in our personal experiences no single individual can capture and reveal all of God no hallelujah now the challenge is that especially for we preachers respectfully speaking every dimension we do not see manifesting in our lives out of insecurity largely we trivialize it and even culture people to believe it is not useful and necessary respectfully speaking i think there is a serious problem there and i'm speaking in love with due honor to the body are we together so if i'm one who is not given to the dynamics of excellence and administration but say i prophesy and i heal the sick I will easily get intimidated because if I am to receive that dimension in my life and ministry and business, I will have to acknowledge the one God gave that grace to. And since I do not want to acknowledge anybody, I want to stand alone as Alpha Omega. I would rather reject and trivialize that grace than for me to admit that I am incomplete, even though yielded. And then honor that grace and receive it into my space to improve my life. Let me tell you sincerely, there are many believers today and many troubles in the body of Christ whose solutions were there before the trouble came. But the inability to see the diversity of the body and the wisdom and the grace that has been invested across various dimensions of the body. There are people who have died today who had no business dying if they knew that somewhere in the body is resident the power of life. If they knew that somewhere in the body is the wisdom to bring people out of very simple problems. The unity of faith no single individual i have told you this from a standpoint of administration from a standpoint of faith and the mandate god has given us we owe ourselves and we owe the kingdom the duty to focus on that which was given to us and to drive the vision of the ministry to fruition but with respect to kingdom come you must look beyond koinonia to be holistically built more than koinonia and more than joshua selman's contribution to your spiritual life your arms must be open to the other diversities within the body of christ men of god we must be secured enough to teach this truth to people that i do not have everything even though i have the richness of that which have been given powerful jesus himself as the son of the living god needed help and he did not reject, reject the ministry of um, Simon of Cyrene to help him carry the cross. He would have pushed him and said, I am self-sufficient. Jesus would have died, but not on a tree. And he never would have died a curse because a curse would have to die on the tree. Someone had to help him to finish that assignment. Is God helping us? This is very important. The unity of faith. The unity of faith. I look forward to a time where the body of Christ will attain this state called the unity of faith. Like I would always do, let me give us um, four keys that will help the body of Christ attain unity. This is my contribution. It is not enough to talk about issues and talk about problems. We must scripturally, not emotionally, scripturally propose solutions that can help the body attain to that state of unity. Number one, the first key is genuine love for God and for men. We cannot attain unity as believers if there is no genuine love for God and genuine love for men genuine love for god genuine love for men write for reference please first john chapter 4 you read from verse 7 to 21 we may not have the time to read everything but just write for reference first john chapter 4 7 to 21 romans chapter 12 and verse 10 romans 12 10 and then 
John 13 35 12 10 says be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love it says in honor preferring one another John chapter 13 and verse 35 very instructive scripture it says by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples not when you do well as a pastor not when you pray in tongues and fast not when you teach excellently not when you are doing well as a businessman it says when you have love one for another many people love Jesus but they hate those he loves isn't it a mystery one of the ways you love a man is by loving who and what he loves. I love Jesus, but I hate those he died for. I love Jesus, but I hate those he's interceding for. I love Jesus, but I hate those who bear his name. I love the head, but I hate his body. No. Genuine love for God. Number two, the second key that will help the body attain unto the unity of faith is mutual honor. I cannot emphasize this enough. Mutual honor. Mutual honor. Mutual honor. Hallelujah. Mutual honor. When the man of God stepped in here to sit down, I had to take that time to acknowledge him leaving his busy schedule and everything he had to do to come he would have just followed at home but then to come and sit down and grace this broadcast it's an honor and he's deserving of it and it would be foolish stupid childish and immature to ignore that sacrifice of his presence can i tell you this until we restore the ministry of honor to the body forget about unity we will keep talking about it and it will be gibberish that does not have substance honor must be mutual what is honor honor is the discerning honor is the celebrating and where applicable the rewarding of individuals for their unique contributions hallelujah as much as i love to sing my precious people here have great voices that god has given them amazing people sometimes when i hear them sing i just nod my head and i say oh dear preaching look what you've done to my voice and i just laugh it over and i appreciate them let me tell you this every time you see what you cannot do being done don't trivialize it every time you see what you cannot do being done you prayed for the sick secretly the person was not healed and you watch the person healed don't trivialize it mm -mm. you gave somebody counsel and he failed woefully because of your counsel and here is someone who counsels and builds people to an enviable destiny don't trivialize it honor must be mutual what does that mean that means do not sit in a position where you are the only one who keeps receiving there are people who do you know I can tell you respectfully speaking and this is because I'm talking to the body of Christ it is a weakness in humans most of the things that we criticize or demean in others if people celebrate us for it we enjoy it and sap that glory are we together yeah. you meet a leader who may be sarcastic or may not be well-meaning over people and look at him and say you know i've looked at your life and i think you're an exceptional person that same person will be laughing and say really we glory be to god so somewhere within our hearts we desire even when we know it is a lie we still desire to enjoy and serve all that why would you insult and stop others from celebrating a man a woman a politician a businessman a man of god for instance whereas that is something you crave for and sometimes so desperately mutual honor is the solution thank you so much you are a great man of god or you're a great businessman i read your book and my goodness the wisdom that came from that book and the man you who they celebrated you don't just say wonderful no 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 thank you for the thoughtfulness to have even you know the unashamedness to communicate honor i appreciate you too it's a culture i've indoctrinated myself that nobody will indefinitely keep celebrating me and then i keep being a receiver without being a giver 
and I will do so unashamedly. This is why I started with my honor and appreciation. It's not a ritual. It is from my heart. Hallelujah. Love for the body and mutual honor. Businessmen, let us respect ourselves. Men of God, let us respect ourselves. Parents, respect yourself. Regions, respect yourselves. Are we together? Until there is mutual honor. The moment we make it a point of duty to be excited in demeaning, downplaying, trivializing the relevance and the contribution. Listen, by the reason of the election of grace and by the reason of our personal sacrifices, the truth is we are not the same in terms of impact, in terms of our contribution, in terms of whatever but i you've heard me say it that the least person in the body of christ is doing the best he or she knows to do and we must be able to acknowledge it there are times that i meet men of god sometimes they come to me for prayer and then i say what are you doing oh i'm a pastor um, by god's grace we have 30 or 40 members and they are laughing they are saying it's not even i mean your entire worship team is more than that and i stop them immediately i tell them every one person jesus gave you he died for them and so don't you ever allow yourself to be intimidated with what you think god is doing many people will enjoy it and say don't worry you're a small boy you are starting don't worry you don't do that there are times people send me recharge card and they can send me a recharge card of 100 naira and say apostle i know you don't need this this is for those people i even take the time to bend over backwards to send them a long text with a prayer how do you say sending me a recharge card of 100 naira is nothing the heart the thoughtfulness the intention how many men of god are in the world that you get up i must be stupid to not acknowledge that listen let me tell you you will hardly be able to criticize people you genuinely celebrate are we together mutual honor mutual honor mutual honor we must practice that the final step is forbearance and tolerance i have taught this again the bible says to forbear two scriptures very quickly Colossians chapter 3 from verse 12 to 13. Colossians 3, 12 to 13. Colossians 3, 12 to 13. When you read on, it says, Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering. Uh huh. Forbearing one another. You know what forbearance is? Or tolerance. There is a difference between forgiveness. And forbearance forgiveness has to do with pardoning a default that you intend not to happen again forbearance is creating a permanent system of accommodation for the weakness or the limitation of that individual because it will happen again and again and again there are many people you do not need to forgive you need to forbear If a noisy person tells you, I'm sorry for being noisy, that person does not need forgiveness. That person needs forbearance. Because five minutes after that, that heartfelt communication of, of, um, of, of plea, the person is going to rant at it again. Can I tell you this? I wish I can tell you every ill we see in the body of Christ today will disappear. But I'll be lying. In fact, that reminds me. Let me teach something that I think maybe just to add to it. Listen, this is a kind advice to our global family and as many who care to listen. Listen carefully. Using criticisms, using ill speakings, listen carefully, using sarcasms, as a way of addressing negative things in the body of Christ is the weakest, the weakest way of preaching the gospel. In fact, the most ineffective way of preaching the gospel. It has never produced any sustainable results. Can I tell you the truth? 
there is nothing happening in the body of Christ today that started today it was there right from the early church that's why we need to be students of scripture whether issues that relate to fidelity and morality issues that relate to character issues that relate to extra biblical practices issues all of these issues have been there in the Bible they are not just coming they have always been there hallelujah thank you so much my dear people the crew from Gombe pastor Sam Dogara God bless you thank you are we blessed this is not the first time witchcraft is happening in the body of Christ this is not the first time wrong things are happening in the body of Christ but let me tell you the reason why the church still went forward to become like this because your emphasis becomes your direction the Bible says so mightily grew the word not the issues what was mightily exalted was what prevailed so mightily grew the word and prevailed in spite of what was happening in the early church they were committed and sincere people who continue to give their best and to drive the gospel and in spite of all of the limitations and the troubles within the body with gallancy they handed over that button and transited in glory there were times of persecution in the body of Christ there were times of governmental persecution in the body of Christ so mightily grew the word and prevailed I have said it and I will continue to say it that correcting people in the body of Christ is a ministry and not everybody is given that ministry the same way no not everybody is a police officer or a law enforcement agent even if you see two people fighting you may do your best to stop them but when you want to deal with that issue you hand it over to the law and people accredited with wisdom and intelligence to be able to deal with it if we do not manage this we are going to produce all kinds of problems within the body of Christ they say uneasy lies the head that wears the crown when some of our fathers were praying for me today I listened carefully to everything they said and they prayed and blessed me from their heart I was on my knees with my hands lifted listening to them and receiving everything they said pouring out wisdom from their prayers I understood what they were saying we have to be careful especially we the younger ministers who are just starting there are many heights we have not climbed yet there are many things we do not know yet we owe a duty to be contributors to the building of the body of Christ not the confusion of the body of Christ now the challenge with this kind of approach usually are the younger believers who are completely confused some of those younger believers will lose the faith simply because they do not understand the, it's like everything based on the propositions that come to the body of Christ it is safe based on so many propositions that have happened through the years to even believe that nobody is genuine in the body of Christ no, from people respectfully who have had all kinds of visions of seeing all kinds of men of God every man of God in hell to those who believe every even if Jesus comes now and walks upon the earth somebody will still see a vision of him as Beelzebub we have to be careful one day God will mark our script all of us both the commentators and the players will stand before the judge are we together very very important I love the body of Christ I respect the body of Christ you will never see me open my mouth to talk ill or speak ill of any man of God or any ministry I sincerely desire the growth of every man of God every ministry and every individual now in truth I have my reservations doctrinally speaking in truth I have my that are based on the dealings of God there are things I probably would not have approached it that way but in all of it even in the midst of challenging things that I feel are faulty I make sure that it is done in love let me recommend an alternative Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 15 let me recommend an alternative 
to this wrong or poor approach that we this template we are using in the body of Christ in a bid to restore what we call sanctity or restore righteousness we have to be careful the Bible says but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head even Christ can I tell you even if what you are saying is true the moment the love component is extracted from it people no longer become interested this is one thing you need to know with people before people ever attempt to listen to you whether as a man of God this is true even for politics this is true even for whatever it is before you talk about politicians you talk about whatever people vet the love factor in you the moment they find out that there is no genuine love they don't care what you are saying again speaking the truth in love is a greater alternative a more effective alternative to criticism to tearing down to demeaning no don't do that don't sit down and be criticizing a parent and their child you are criticizing how they are raising their child whereas your own child you are not sure of what your child is and you are there tearing down somebody else no don't sit down and criticize another man's church ministry institution that is not your assignment I will repeat it again it is the most inefficient way historically speaking biblically speaking of preaching the gospel no one has ever won that way the alternative is this that I give to you to speak the truth in love the fourth key the fourth key to attaining unity in the body of Christ is to pray for the body ah i cannot emphasize this enough pray for the body pray for the body pray for the body ephesians chapter 6 and verse 18 we must pray for the body of christ ephesians 6 18 praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with perseverance and supplication for all saints for all saints for all saints first Timothy first Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1 first Timothy 2 and verse 1 is God helping us first Timothy 2 and verse 1 I exhort therefore that first of all supplications prayers intercession and giving of thanks be made for all men is that in your Bible for all men for all men you must pray there are many people today who are my friends in ministry my friends in leadership there are many areas we do not directly agree and we are aware that we do not agree in these areas yet the bond of friendship is extremely powerful and altogether profitable to both of us listen Please hear me. I'm teaching you this from a heart of love because I owe you as my dear people and then as a contribution to the body of Christ. This is especially for spiritual leaders and it extends to all kinds of leaders. We must be careful. Do not create a system of hatred and sedition and party spirit just because you do not agree doctrinally. Or just because you do not agree as far as certain thoughts are concerned we must be careful if I mentor believers to say any man of God you see who is not preaching what I am preaching or is not part of the fold whether by covenant connection reject the person throw away the person that is a terrible thing it is a wicked statement because if Christ tarries one day I will not be here but the error see errors don't easily die even when those who bring them are long gone it will still be in the system and can become a pandemic hallelujah yeah. there are many believers today whose spiritual lives would have been improved greatly if the accommodation were given to them 
to be able to tap and receive from the rich heritage that is within the body for instance someone may be struggling with let's say lost or whatever and the holy spirit can speak to the person listen to this man of god or this father of faith's message and he knows that contained within that man and that ministry and that father of faith is the grace to cure this in one day but simply because a subliminal advice a body language that has been given by either his man of God or something of that sort they would rather sit down and die in silence than to tap into the blessing there are people who in within one month their financial status can change if only their hearts will be open to receive of the provision of wisdom and grace that is resident within the body but they would rather sit down and die in silence hallelujah we must intercede for the body of Christ not criticize the body of Christ to pray one of the greatest gifts that anyone can give me as a man of God is to pray for me you give me food I will eat I will go to the toilet and that is it you give me whatever all of that will go but when you pray for me you are making investments for my destiny is one of the things that give me joy it gives me joy during my birthday because there are several ministries across the globe prayer chains the last one week has been full of all kinds of prayer night vigils prayer chains just for me now I honor those people and I appreciate them and as many as I could reach I told them thank you for this let us pray you do not know the kind of attack that is on every evangelist, every apostle, every reverend, every bishop, every whoever names the name of Christ. The moment you stand for Jesus, just be sure that Satan is coming after you. Not even Jesus was spared. When he left him, the Bible says he left him for a season. Let me encourage everyone listening. Please pray for your pastor anything you look for in the body of christ you will find it if you look for error you will find it if you look for faults you will find it if you look for weaknesses you will find it if you look for strength you will find it if you look for satan you will find him if you look for jesus you will find him if you look for flesh you will find him if you look for sincerity you will find it it is all within the body and in the midst of the lamb stands I saw one like the son of man the good news is that in the midst of all of these things Jesus is still in his body I am personally convinced that every church and every ministry that sincerely names the name of Christ for the sake of the witness of Christ Jesus Christ will always live a witness hallelujah the final thing I'll say about the unity of faith is the moment you believe you are the only one who is right, you are wrong. Let me repeat. The moment you believe you are the only one who is right, you are wrong. Because believing you are the only one who is right is number one, an insult to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Number two, an insult to the ministry of the fivefold, the priesthood. Number three, an insult to the power of the cross. Can I tell you, you never find any point from when Jesus died and resurrected where only one individual was standing in righteousness. No, you will find that in the days of Noah. You will find that in the Old Testament. But from the moment the Spirit was poured lavishly without measure, the Spirit will always have witnesses. Remember, He's called the Spirit of Truth. So away with some of this mentality that we carry around the body where we believe Joshua Selman believing, I am the only one who is right. I am the only one who is teaching what is correct. I am the only one who is mentoring correctly. I can tell you by the authority of scripture that is absolute nonsense mm -mm. we are called to communicate the dimension of truth as given to us 
with sincerity and truth while praying for the body of Christ and helping to manage the excesses but with honor for all the other dimensions I will repeat it is absolute nonsense if I, if I ever stand here in koinonia and teach you and make you believe that nobody else knows that truth how did you learn it then because a man cannot receive anything except it is given so the one who received and the one who gave who is greater don't you ever believe that there are unrighteous people unholy people and weak people in the body and just a few who God came to them oh such a deception most of those things came from culture and because of our inability to contend for transformation I'm saying this with love to help the body for the sake of believers that are coming up I repeat it is nonsense Christ is still in his body the Holy Spirit is as powerful as ever helping people to encounter Jesus even if every man of God in the body fails the body will still not die because in a great house what made the house great was not the vessels what made the house great was the builder the builder is still there regardless the quality of vessels please let us not demean the body of Christ I'm saying this because many people if we don't salvage the body of Christ many people will leave the Christian faith justifiably into extra biblical practices I may fail as an individual but the body cannot fail I may fail as a church but the body cannot fail I announce to all and sundry again that the body of Christ is a living system with Christ himself being the head of the body and the fact that he's the head of the body we cannot fail in the name of Jesus Christ it says I will build my church don't insult that architect he's a master builder no man of God builds the church no doctrine builds the church there is the builder he's still building so as much as we observe limitations in the body as much as we address them as much as we manage this please let us not give the world an impression like the church is a weak defeated entity full of licentious people full of weak people no the church that Jesus died for is a living church that is alive the church that Jesus died for is a church that is powerful he is the builder there are things that cannot be done by any other institution on earth except the church all my days on earth I will away the moment that I see you face to face mm. Nothing in this world can satisfy Jesus, you're the cup that will run dry Treasure of my heart and of my soul in my weakness you are merciful Redeemer of my past and present wrong You're the holder of my future days to come Amazing So who is like you Lord in all the earth much less love and beauty and less worth nothing in this world can satisfy Jesus you're the cup that will run dry message number one to the body of Christ is the power of purpose connect every desire to purpose otherwise you would not find fulfillment and I have proposed to you the theme for our living and that which drives us to see Jesus revealed and to see Jesus glorified number two the purity of heart we must return to vet the two states of our heart blessed are the pure in heart 
for they shall see God. Number three, the unity of the body. Oh, this is my prayer. Unity does not mean uniformity. The body of Christ will never do the same thing. But we can be motivated by the same purpose. I look forward to times when a man of God will be organizing crusade and another man of God who may not totally agree doctrinally can say this is my seed I'm sending bosses you still keep your reservation as far as mentoring and building the people committed to you is concerned but you are able to stand to say I love this Jesus is glorified he's bigger than what I feel or I do not feel I look forward to times when men of God can bump into themselves, whether at the airport somewhere. Oh, how are you? How is the work? May God bless you. Not you are this, you are that. No, you are carnal, you are satanic. Go away. No, it won't happen that way. It's the same heaven we are going to. I wonder what is going to happen when we all get there. Hmm. Because none of us built it. And since the one who built it admitted all of us, there are not five tables. There is one giant table. That supper. We are all sitting there. Let me tell you this. Before I talk about the last point and we pray. Do you know. I learned this very early in life and ministry. That some of the people making the most impact spiritually. I say this respectfully speaking. They are not the Joshua Selmans you are seeing. Believe me, thank God for the little and the bits that we're doing. But if God is to assess and arrange people on earth, number one, based on their closeness to him, and number two, based on the impact, you will be surprised that some of us that you celebrate will be at the back of the queue, thanking God that we are even in the queue. And you'll be surprised that those you will see in front are not on TV. Nobody knows them. They may be pastors of 10 members. Some of them may be quiet intercessors like some of our mothers. Anna the prophetesses praying for Jesus to succeed. The day I recognized this and I learned this, it gave me that sense to know that every time I stand before God's people and as God continues to lift me, I see it as a privilege and a debt that I must pay. I don't stand here simply because i'm the best and the finest i know you have celebrated me and i know you are sincere but i'm wise enough to know the truth when we stand before him you will see a woman who could not even speak english when we stand before him you will see one gardener somewhere who never had the privilege to be on tv when we stand before him, you will see one intercessor from a village, one missionary that served God quietly till he died. And based on that spiritual stratification, some of us who have been making noise from time immemorial, God will now rearrange us and will stand at the back. And some of those quiet people will come with honor and stand in front. Knowing this should give us wisdom early. We stand here only by grace. We minister, our sufficiency is not of ourselves, but of Christ who has made us able ministers. Accepting this is not weakness. Accepting this is great strength. Number four. My fourth message to the body of Christ and to our global family before we pray is a very old message that many believers do not hear again to live with eternity in view to live with eternity in view first corinthians 15 and verse 19 hmm. if in this life only we have hope in christ we are of all men did i do my best to live for truth did i live my life for you when it's all been said and done 
All my treasures will mean nothing Only what I've done for love's reward Will stand the test of time Lord, your mercy is so great That you look beyond our weakness And find treasure jewels in married clay Turning sinners into saints And I will always sing your praise here on earth and ever after For you've shown me heaven's my true home When it's all been said and done You're my life when life is gone I've sung this song for many years And it never gets old Can I tell you this? Hmm. Give me Revelation chapter 20 and verse 11. One day we will stand before Jesus. Please listen to me. A day will come you will wake up in the morning and find out there is no koinonia again. There is no election again, Nigeria. A day will come you will get up in the morning and you will find out, dear civil servant, there is no going for work again. A day will come you will get up in the morning and find out the enemy you seek to die, both you and him, the scene has changed. A day will come, you will get up and you will find out the people who massage your ego and lie to you, they are no longer there. And I saw a great white throne. And him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away. Is that in your Bible? And there was found no place for them. Verse 12. We're reading to 15. And I saw the dead, small and great. This is the thing about death that is scary. Small and great. That means the concept of small and great is a relative statement. Only within the confines of earth. With respect to death, does not know small, does not know great. Stand before God. Notice the name of any, there's no preacher's name mentioned there. There's no businessman's name mentioned there. There's no title and politician, apostle, professor, excellency. No. Small and great. You are one of the two. Stand before God. And the Bible says the books were opened. And another book was opened, which was the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. This is the Bible. The sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the death which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. 14. And death and hell itself were cast into the lake of fire. He said this is the second death. The last verse. And whosoever apostle prophet businessman giant in ministry small man whoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire full stop can i tell you all of the wars we have in our world today right now we're in a time of politics and it's good to you know all kinds of people fighting, president, chairman, national assembly. Thank God for that. Students hoping that strike will resume so that they will go to school. Preachers hoping that more members will come. Everybody hoping one day when the real referee, the referee is not social media. Uh -uh. The referee is not the preacher. When the real referee rings that bell, whether you are prepared or not, the match must stop. And he will gather all of us and we will stand. That day will be a day of pleasant surprises. Please hear me. You must live with eternity in view. No matter how long you live, the highest I've seen in my life is about 136. But no matter how long you live, 
either he will come to meet you or you will go to meet him but you must depart this realm yes we are returning back to earth but not this version of earth this will be folded like a curtain when i stand before god he's not going to say apostle how are you no <laughs> no when you stand before him you will not say koinonia member how are you small and great all our titles will mean nothing that is the day we will know that he is king of kings and lord of lords please let me remind us i'm both old and new school permit me to be old school now jesus is coming back soon i repeat it jesus is coming back soon koinonia global body of christ planet earth the lord jesus the monarch of the universe is returning he will return i assure you is one of the seven pillars of the christian faith he's returning and this life will be rolled and folded like a curtain what does that mean if all your relevance and everything that you have is just connected to money and titles and anointing and ministry and politics and any other thing you may be disappointed when he comes can I tell you the truth I made up my mind that nothing around me and nothing outside me is what my attachment to Thank God for money, but it will come and go away. Thank God for titles, they will come and go away. We're wrapping up. Listen very carefully. This birthday broadcast, hear me, Koinonia Global and creation and all who are listening. It is not the celebration of a celebrity. It is not a celebration of some great man. Without Christ, without Jesus, this man you see, there is very little to me as a person. I will tell you this. If there is anything in my life today that is worth celebrating, including the gift of time that was given to me, it is because he's alive and it's because he has shown mercy. Thank God for the cakes you have made. Thank God for the gifts thank god for the wonderful things and i truly i don't downplay it humbled i don't know how many times tears rolled out of my eyes as i rolled on the floor before the lord thanking him for the gift of life but i am reminding you again bad days is not the celebration that you were born it's the celebration of what you are doing with the life that you have been given you only truly qualify to celebrate your birthday if you are living it for Jesus and living it for purpose, not if you are living. I stand before you today thanking you for your love and everything you have done for bearing our limitations, praying and upholding us. I thank my precious leaders. I want to thank the fathers of faith in this nation who have loved me so personally and invested and continue to invest in my life I do not take your fatherhood and love for granted I thank God for all of the pillars in my life the men of God senior colleagues contemporaries prodigies sons and daughters all together Koinonia Global I want to sincerely thank you from Europe to America to Asia to Africa Nigeria right here you have demonstrated levels of love that I cannot begin to explain and I'm not playing with words I really mean what I'm saying I want to thank you I want to thank my family I want to thank the workers you are seated here because of your dogged commitment the world sees the face of Joshua Selman but they do not know that there are people who make that face visible and to be able to serve God comfortably. Those who have sown into my life and into the ministry, those who pray for me, thank you. Thank you sincerely. Thank you. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let me leave you with this. If you truly desire to celebrate my birthday today, let me tell you three things to do that will bring joy to my heart. Number one, the first thing I plead that you do for me is to pray for me. Pray for me. He said, brethren, pray for us. More than give to me, more than support what I represent, please pray for me. Pray for me and pray for every man of God that you know and you love. Number one. Number two, let me encourage you, our global family and all believers, look for two, any two koinonia teachings that has blessed you and bless somebody with it today. Any two koinonia messages that have blessed you and changed your life, the deliverance series, the series on the kingdom, whatever, look for any two and bless someone with it. Number three, you want to celebrate my birthday today? The third and final request, pray for Nigeria. Pray for Nigeria. We are at a sensitive period of transition and for God's sake, we need to take responsibility and pray for this nation. We are going to act, but can I tell you, acting without praying will only recycle pain because only God, we are only, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. By reason of my being close by privilege to several politicians, I've had all kinds of opinions and different things about perspectives in Nigeria. What I'm going to tell us is we must pray and trust God to hear and know the will of God first before acting. This emotional acting based on sentiments will only recycle pain. I'm saying it as one who fears God and loves my nation. We only stand entire. God is only committed to backing and defending his will. Let us be aware of emotions. Let us be aware of sentiments. We must look to Jesus and say, Lord, where you stand is where we stand. Pray for me. Share the message with someone and pray for Nigeria. Pray for our leaders present and pray for our leaders to come. We owe a duty under God more than complaining, more than insulting, more than castigating. Let us pray. I know that there are many things that may not seem to be the way it is in our nation now. Please hear me. Christians, pray for Nigeria. Muslims, pray for Nigeria. Even if you don't pray, mean well for Nigeria. Hallelujah. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let your love increase. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. The walls of pride and prejudice shall cease. When we are We are only safe in our nation if every other thing is safe death does not ask whether you are a Christian or Muslim death does not ask whether you are a preacher or a businessman if we are careless over our lives all of us will suffer that is the truth it is a time where we need to pray and then we need to act accordingly as God grants grace I repeat without prejudice or biases it is going to be a combination of spirituality, intelligence, and counsel. I repeat, spirituality, intelligence, and counsel. Blindly just moving with spirituality alone will still end us in trouble. Blindly walking with um, intelligence alone will end us in trouble. Blindly walking with counsel alone will end us in trouble. We need that tripartite combo of spirituality, intelligence and counsel hallelujah 
thank you very much for the privilege and the opportunity to celebrate with me i am truly truly honored i want to appreciate our global family and thank you for all of you who have listened carefully to this broadcast i also want to thank the leadership of ait and every other television station thank you so much for the live broadcast may the lord bless you and increase you and to our media team the lord honor you in the name of jesus hallelujah now i'm going to speak over your life uh, but before i do that since he's here i hope he doesn't get embarrassed i will plead with reverend sam oye he's a great man of prayer to come and stand and just speak over the body of christ even on this occasion of my birthday and then i'll round up and speak a blessing please let's rise and honor reverend sam oye god bless you sir are you clapping amen can we just lock hands together everybody breaking the barriers between our states our tribes our ethnicities our diversities our party affiliation and exalting the body of Christ as the most important thing in a time like this we are asking that in the name of Jesus Christ the Lord will send the wind the four winds into this nation and we ask that as it was in the time of Ezekiel the Bible says and as I prophesied the wind came bones came together bones came together we speak in the name of Jesus Christ that the body of Christ will come together in the name of Jesus the Christ we pray that from this moment everything the adversary has planted within us to divide us to compartmentalize us to make us focus on one part of the body as the whole of the body we pray that by the teaching that has gone for today let the barriers begin to break let the barriers begin to break we break the barriers between pentecostals and catholics between Catholics and Baptists, between Baptists and Methodists, we pray that Jesus alone will stand glorified in this country. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray that our children will see themselves as Christians. They will not see themselves by labels. They will not see themselves as cherubim and seraphim. They will not see themselves as somebody from somewhere else. Lord, we pray from Koinonia that unity will spill across the body of Christ. We pray for everyone here that as you move out of this place, you will become an agent of unity. You will become an instrument of unity. You will become an instrument of togetherness. The Bible says how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. For fair, God commands the blessing. We ask that the blessing will come on Nigeria. As we come together in the body of Christ, let the blessing rest on this country. As the church becomes united, let the nation rise. Let our nation rise. Nigeria, rise from the ashes of your past. Nigeria, rise to limelight. Nigeria, rise to become a first world. Nigeria rise from the shames we have been in. Nigeria rise from the pain we are in. Let the church rise. Let this nation rise. Our schools will walk. Our hospitals will thrive. Our roads will be properly done. We speak to every sector of this nation. We command things to work. We call for a new leadership to emerge. We call for a new leadership to emerge from Zion. Let leaders emerge from the north. Let leaders emerge from the west. Let leaders emerge from the east. Let leaders emerge from the south. We stand in the place of prayer today and we decree and declare 
every intention to divide this, divide this country we frustrate it in darkness Nigeria shall not be at war lives will not be lost 2023 shall come to pass and we decree and declare Nigeria shall have great leadership and the body of Christ shall exalt Jesus we call for the wind to blow let our bones come together let our tendons come together let our ligaments come together let our sinews come together Nigeria arise Africa arise our children arise in Jesus mighty name we'll pray would you please stretch your hands towards this man of God it's one thing for if you follow apostles movement everywhere so much demand on this man of God everywhere listen to me you don't know why you need to pray this is the first time ever in the history of Nigeria I travel I speak a lot in America on major platforms but this is the first time that we will see Caucasian communities Latino we will see African Americans way back in St. Kitts Jamaica Barbados Bahamas everybody tuned into this man let me tell you this whilst we are celebrating this moment the adversary is planning schemes the adversary is not after him is after you how will the adversary strike you strike him strike the shepherd and koinonia you will lift up your voice to god in prayer father keep him i want you to pray like you pray for yourself i, I want you to lift up your voice i want you to lift up your voice say my father my father keep the servant of god hold him steady keep him every plot every plan every intention agenda every plot of the wicked we stand in the place of prayer we put an embargo on satanic intentions we divinely make legislations over satanic moves we decree and declare that their hands will not perform their enterprise their counsels will not stand their words will not prevail over joshua selman let your hand rest upon him let your mercy prevail over him guide his step direct his path lead him in the way no weapon formed against him will ever prosper every tongue that rise up against him in judgment we condemn we condemn we condemn in going out in coming in his life will not be cut short in jesus mighty name we'll pray Sam. hallelujah praise the lord i can tell you this god is doing something in the body of christ it is like it was in the wedding in cana listen carefully the bible says that some people the wine finished and then there were others who came to jesus and new wine was already there but it was not known and Jesus turned water to wine and when they took it to the, the, the leaders the rulers they said where did this come from let me tell you there is a new wine I can tell you this prophetically it is not only koinonia that represents that new wine from the west to the south the east and the west from Nigeria Ghana, Africa, South Africa, America, Europe, and even the nations and regions that we think Christianity is going. Listen, trust the Holy Spirit. Therefore, I decree and declare in the name of Jesus, who is the Son of the living God, 
manifest over our global family i declare in the name of jesus god who has helped me may he help you in this season god who has shown me mercy may he show you mercy in the name of jesus christ i decree and declare that your faith will not fail i decree and declare that your love for jesus and your love for men and your love for the body of christ will not go down may pride and arrogance be far from your life in the name of jesus may you be men and women of solid character in the name of jesus no weapon fashioned against you will prosper and every tongue that rises up against you we condemn in judgment hear me the fullness of your days you will fulfill in the name of jesus christ and i prophesy over you according to genesis 17 and verse 6 great and mighty leaders and kings will rise from you captains of industry pastors apostles prophets evangelists teachers in the name of jesus christ and i speak over the body of christ in the name of jesus we tap from the blessing and the wisdom of our fathers and we declare the body of christ shall stand every denomination we pray in the name of jesus may the lord uphold you from the east to the west we pray for every man of god in this nation who names the name of christ may the lord uphold you may the lord comfort you may the lord strengthen you in the name of jesus we pray for christians in this nation you are blessed in jesus name we pray for muslims in this nation you are blessed in jesus name we pray for everyone who is part of this nation you are blessed in jesus name we pray for the leaders in this nation the lord shows you help and mercy we pray for our heads of parliament and all the parliamentarians captains of industry you are blessed in jesus name we pray for our law enforcement agents you are blessed in jesus name we pray for the judiciary you are blessed in jesus name and i pray for everyone in the name of jesus father give everyone a birthday gift that only you can give and i pray finally for every worker everyone who has stood in as a pillar helping to drive this vision those who are here as the workforce and then those who represent a network of our support systems across the globe in the name of jesus be blessed in the name of jesus be blessed for in jesus name we pray i'd like you to turn to one or two people and say congratulations thank you thank you thank you hallelujah thank you my dear people i love you with all my heart thank you hallelujah we share the grace in fellowship the grace of our lord jesus christ the love of god the sweet fellowship of the holy spirit rest and abide with us now and forevermore amen surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives as we dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Just... Hello. Scriptures exhort us from the book of Proverbs. It says, My son, attend to my sins. Incline thy ears to my words. Let them not depart from thy eyes and keep them in the midst of thee. As you have listened to this message, we believe that you are going to reap the blessings thereof if you attend to these words as well. That you will keep these words in the midst of your heart. That no matter the circumstance, your eyes are going to be fixed on these words. And as you have been blessed, we will tell you to share this message. Be an evangelist by sharing to others to be blessed. 
and then subscribe to this channel for us because we have loads of videos we have loads of content that is going to make you blessed that is going to set you on course that is going to set you ablaze and don't forget to like for us thank you